we have a quorum. And so we're going to go ahead and start the board meeting. Welcome to today's Board of Education meeting. Um, before we start the meeting, I want to let everyone know that our, our last board meeting here is in the community room. And the next board meeting will be in February the 6th. Or the last board meeting here will be February the 6th. We'll be discussing new locations later this evening. OK, session one, opening. I will now call the meeting to order. Before we adopt the agenda, oh no, wait. We will begin our open session with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, would Caden Grant from Cajon High School please join us? Uh, please join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Before we adopt the agenda, Dr. Marzen, are there any changes? Yes, thank you, Madam President. We would like to read in a change for item 3.1 to add uh, Janie Christakos, Chief Business Officer, will provide information regarding the 2017-18 Governor's Budget Proposal. Uh, so we'll add that. It'll still be under item 3.1. Uh, we just failed to add that sentence. We wanted to add that sentence. Again, it reads as follows. Janie Christakos, Chief, Bu Chief Business Officer, will provide information regarding the 2017-18 Governor's Budget Proposal. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and vote. Yeah, board, they just repaired this or did some work on it, and so we're hoping it'll work for you. If not, we'll call a, a verbal roll call. Let's go ahead and do a verbal roll call on this. Okay. Aye. 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 Okay, okay, we have four zero. So it passes. We're moving now to 1.4, inspirational reading by Mr. Danny Tillman. Thank you very much. Um, I don't like to do readings. And uh, last time I gave a speech, uh, Mr. Gallo mocked me. So I just decided I'd have my daughter come down and sing a song of give us some inspiration. So my daughter, Denise Tillman. Now, Denise actually went to Roosevelt Elementary School and yes. Richardson and Aurora Valley and then Cal State San Bernardino. Need a microphone? Those are live. Those, the one in the middle is red. Her name. Her name is Denise Melissa Tillman. All right. Hello. 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 I don't know about two. I just live from day to day. I won't borrow from its sunshine for its skies may turn to gray. And I won't worry about my future. For I know what Jesus said. And today he walks beside me. For he knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But Tomorrow, and I know 
Thank you. Wow. Somebody just asked me if I sing like that. I sing better than that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you, Denise. That was fantastic. fantastic. Beautiful voice. Beautiful. Very talented Beautiful. Daughter. Beautiful. Thank you so much for singing for us. That's beautiful. So we're going to go ahead and move along for 2.0. Special presentations, 2.1, special presentation with Graciano Gomez. The Board of Education wishes to honor the life and legacy of former board member, Mr. Graciano Gomez, who passed away in December. Mr. Gomez was a well-known community tra trailblazer who dedicated his life to advocating for the Inland Empire's Latino community. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, uh, Madam President. We, we will now turn this part of the agenda over to uh, Linda Bardier, and she'll assist us in these special presentations. Thank you, Ms. Bardier. And I believe you want the board and cabinet to join. Yes, Thank we'd you. like to invite the board to please come and stand down here so that we can greet the family. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a bittersweet day for our school district as well as our community. While our community room is certainly filled with the air of celebration, we will be honoring our championship Cajon High School football team a little later, but we're going to begin by taking this opportunity to recognize two important members of the education community who recently passed away. At this time, we will honor the life and legacy of longtime community activists, Ms. Frances Grice and Mr. Graciano Gomez. We will begin by um, honoring Mrs. Frances Grice. Is there anyone here from her family or extended friends? We will begin by recognizing Mrs. Grice, and we ask Ms. Valerie Beauregard and any other family member and friends to please come forward to receive a special resolution acknowledging the hard work and dedication that Ms. Grice devoted to our students and community. A Detroit native, Ms. Grice formed the Community League of Mothers, which advocated for the city's poorest students and fought to end segregation in San Bernardino schools. Her efforts were successful, and in 1973, the California Supreme Court ruled in the group's favor, capping Grice's decades-long battle to end school segregation. Frances also launched Operation Second Chance, which was a job training program for young adults living in the city's west side. The program was instrumental in helping forge a path to prosperity for many people in our city, including some of our own school district employees. And more recently, Frances passionately spearheaded the effort to rename a school after longtime San Bernardino Mayor Bob Holcomb. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in honoring the life and legacy of Ms. Frances Grice with an applause that would make her proud. At this time, I would like to invite Mrs. Trini Gomez, widow of former school board member, Mr. Graciano Gomez, along with his daughter, Anna Gomez, his son, and other family members and friends to please come forward at this time. In addition to being honored this evening by the Board of Education for San Bernardino City Unified School District, we also have received a special recognition from Assembly Member Ms. El Eloise Gomez Reyes, who represents Assembly District 47. Uh, let's thank Mrs. Uh, Assembly Member Gomez for this honor as well.
Like Francis Grice, Mr. Graciano Gomez dedicated his life as much of his professional career to advocating for the rights of the underprivileged. In 1972, Graciano made history when he became the first Latino elected to our Board of Education. When he saw that Latino students were not given the same opportunities as other students, Graciano advocated for minority teachers and counselors. Graciano was not one to turn a blind eye to injustice. After serving in World War II, Graciano and fellow veterans founded American Legion 650 to advocate for social change. And when he saw that local media seldom covered the Latino community, he began publishing a weekly newspaper, the Inland Empire Hispanic News. In 2014, our own district named Graciano Gomez Elementary School in his honor. Audience, let's give a warm round of applause to Graciano Gomez and his family and friends. At this time, we'll take a short break um, before proceeding to the recognition of our dedicated young men who achieved great success, and our Board of Education will be poised over to my left. You know, I want to make a few comments uh, while we're greeting the families. Um, one, I personally, uh, like many of you did, knew Francis Grice, knew Graciano Gomez, uh, Frances, I didn't know her as well personally, but I'll tell you what, she was a go-getter. Uh, when she came into this boardroom and spoke, everybody listened, stopped what they were doing and rallied around her cause. And that's been the story of her life and legacy. She's left her mark on this community. Graciano Gomez, I'll tell you what, I have uh, never met such a dedicated man whose heart and compassion was just so deep in this community. Uh, he often would talk with us as leaders in the community and people looked to him for advice. Uh, I looked to him for advice. I went out to lunch with him one time because I was facing some difficult challenges and he encouraged me. And here's a man that was at that point, I think he was like in his late 80s or almost 90, I can't recall, but he was just always an encouragement. And one day I came to my office after this, this tough spot and I found he'd give me a gift of a guy a better, the, the, the beautiful shirt. And I was able to wear that with pride and so grateful for his friendship uh, and the compassion that he's laid out on this community, his wife Trini, and I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for all that you've done in this community. And he's left a mark, lived a life well, set a good example uh, for us as leaders to live in similar ways. So thank you very much. It is our honor to recognize the Cajon High School football team, a team of talented athletes who put the Cowboys on the map by reaching the CIF Division II AA State Finals. Before we honor the CIF Southern Section Division IV champions, we're going to watch a video highlighting some of their many accomplishments. <laughs>
it has been for the Cajon Cowboys. I'd also like to invite Cajon High School principal, Ms. Tina Bishop, to please come forward along with her administrative team and any teachers and staff who may be in the audience. Let's give this team a big round of applause. We also have the Cajon High School cheerleaders who are here to help us welcome the players and coaches who will make it happen. They are here performing under the direction of cheer advisor, Ms. Katrina Gonzalez. Let's welcome them with a big round of applause. great sport like that, let's give them another round of applause. Thank you, cheerleaders. You guys were great. Thank you to the Cajon High Cheer for setting the stage for us to honor the players for their relentless pursuit of excellence. In the interest of time, we encourage every player and coach to come forward now as a team. You don't have to worry because your name will still be announced individually and you will re be receiving special certificates of recognition from our Board of Education as well as from Assemblymember Mark Steinnorth and your families will also receive a packet of souvenir magazines that were distributed earlier tonight. So please make your way and start with uh, board member Mr. Danny Tillman, come and shake their hands, and then come and stand where the performers were. First up is Derek Anderson, Theodore Archuleta, Spencer Barba, Christian Benjamin, Keon Bradley, Jaden Daniels, who was also named the Sun Newspaper Player of the Year, Jordan Dean Reynosa, Darius DeGene, Isaiah Ellis, Ephraim Esquire, Alec Estrada, Cameron Forrest, Daniel Fortune, Adrian Garcia, Jose Garcia, Josh Gibson, Caden Grant, Daniel Gutierrez, Nate Harden, Dominic Hart, Josh Hatchett, Manuel Herrera, Javon Hill, 
DJ Jackson, Chris Johnson, Adrian Jones, Dennis Jones, Darren Jones, Marcus Kilpatrick, Trey King, Timmy Liu, Israel Lopez, Chris Malave, Jeremiah Martin, who was named the Defensive Player of the Year by the Sun newspaper and is one of the top college football prospects in the country, Furman Mauricio, Jason Mitchell, Preston Montgomery, Dewan Moon, Trey Noriega, Andrew Ostrich, Hector Ortega, Michael Parson, Jonathan Perkins, Omar Perkins, Elijah Porter, Ramon Ramirez Castro, Julian Rios, Jorge Rivera, Rodney Robinson, Tyler Sales, Wally Togotugo, Gabriel Uribe, Alfonso Valencia, Isaac Vera, Michael Vargas, Anthony Watkins, Jerome Weber, Sam Williams, and last but certainly not least, Joseph Yarber. Those are the Cajon Cowboys. Let's give them all a round of applause. We also have a special message from one of the Cajon players. So I think is it Caden? Please come forward and I'll give you the microphone. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Caden Grant. I'm the center for the team number 55. <laughs> uh, first, we'd like to thank our San Bernardino School District and council members for your amazing support and your continued financial support throughout our entire season. So thank you, guys. Um, thank you. This is such a great honor. Our whole team really worked hard for this season, and we really appreciate you recognizing our team today. We absolutely must thank all of our assistant coaches, trainers, and the Booster Club, each of you guys kept us looking good with all these multiple uniforms that we have on and kept us our physical and mentally strong so we couldn't have done anything without each of you guys. Well, I'd love to thank Coach Rogers. Thank you so much for believing in us from the very start. It was you who said, yep, I think we have a special group of guys this year and we can take it all. And the mindset that you put into us, putting the number 16 everywhere, so you know that we're not going to go anywhere short but 16 games and we accomplished that. So we want to thank you and your leadership, Coach Rogers. And everyone on our team realized early that we were playing for way more than just ourselves. And when we all saw the YouTube video, uh, we quickly knew that we were playing for the Cone alumni that took the field long before us. And for those who follow, and more importantly, for the entire city of San Bernardino who's been through so much, and we stay strong. So for each person named here, and for everyone in the city of San Bernardino, we had you in mind the whole time, and we hope you made you proud. As the student at the team recognized, they could not have done this well without the coaches who dedicated countless hours to developing and encouraging the players every step of the way. So we will be presenting the coaches with special certificates of recognition, those who made it possible for the CIF State Championship Trophy to come home to our city here. First up, we would like to honor head coach Nick Rogers, who was also named Coach of the Year by HS Game Time Magazine. <laughs> and you could just wave your hand from the back. I think all the coaches are back there, but we might not be able to see them. Jordan Anderson, defensive line coach. Oh, they're all coaching the, okay, so I'll go through all of the um, honorees. Kim Batten, the special teams coordinator. Michael Bunsey, the defensive line coach. Ernie Burries, the running back coach. Javon Daniels, the wide receivers coach. Dwight Forrest, defensive backs coach. Kenny Gant, the assistant coach. Kendrick Harris, offensive line coach. Jeff Imbriani, the quarterback coach. Will Prompet, the defensive coordinator, Ty Saray, offensive line coach, and Eric Valencia, linebackers coach, and not last but not least, the trainer, Kayla Mann. So let's give them all a big round of applause. <laughs> 
And I know uh, board member Tillman has a few words that he would like to share right at this time. Thank you. I'd like to uh, just give a special congratulations to Cajon's team um, and the school itself. Ms. Bishop, a great principal, and all the coaches and uh, team members. I know a lot of you guys aren't here today, so maybe they'll watch it on TV. Um, but I know a lot of them since they were in Pop Warner, um, Jane Daniels and little, I call them little old, but Omar Perkins and a lot of the other players for a long time. And all the parents in the audience, would you stand up? <laughs> of course, uh, part of success is all the parents that um, take them to practice and uh, get their physicals and um, just donate and give back so much. And I want to give a special thanks to um, Miss Regina Jackson. Regina, stand up. Okay. A few years ago when um, her uh, son first came to play, I don't know if board members remember, but she came down to the podium with this ripped up practice jersey. Was better. She found the raggediest practice jersey she could find and told us this is what we practice in and the real uniforms aren't much better. But after that advocacy, the board um, decided to vote and spent $1.5 million, not just for Cajon, but for all the teams. And we realized it makes a big difference. I talked to a lot of the coaches um, and, and athletic directors and realized that if we invest in our students and our kids in San Bernardino, then our students that are, will stay in San Bernardino. And they'll grow and they'll be champions. And Cajon, you've proved that. So I just want you to know that the entire board is going to continue to support you. And we appreciate all the hard work from all of you. Thank you. And uh, just to reiterate, all of the uh, team members will get a packet like this that contains a copy of the video, their highlight video that we watched this evening, as well as several copies of the magazine. So the Cajon administration will coordinate the distribution of the packets. Congratulations, Cajon. You did make us proud. Thank you for coming tonight. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the meeting. I do, I do want to recognize that 2.2, we weren't able to speak upon, which was a special presentation on Francis Grice. And I do want to read this portion of it because I didn't get a chance to read it. The Board of Education wishes to honor the life and legacy of Ms. Francis Grice, who passed away in late December. Ms. Grice was a longtime champion of civil rights and mentored dozens of community leaders and public officials in the in empire. And so I know she was, she actually advocated um, for not only the children in our area, parents, and during the civil rights movement, she even told me a story where in City Hall, the, the, the KKK was with uh, openly in the streets um, as, 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 as racist as it can be here in, in the city of San Bernardino and she still fought on, and uh, with that, she was a strong woman, a brave woman who, who continued to fight for our children, our families, and uh, we will dearly miss her, and she's a wonderful woman. So we're gonna go ahead and go to, uh, we've already did 2.3, going to 2.4, recognition of African American History Month. Um, okay, so do you, wanna, do you wanna read this one? Go ahead, Ms. Rogers. Recognition of African American History Month. Each year, the San Bernardino City Unified School District joins other organizations in towns and cities in our state and nation in observing and recognizing the achievements of our citizens of African descent. Whereas African whereas Americans of African descent contributed to the development of our nation in countless ways and participated in every effort to secure, protect, and maintain the essence and substance of American democracy, and whereas African American history reflects a spirit of determination, perseverance, ingenuity, and cultural pride in the struggle to share equality and the opportunities of a nation founded upon the principles of freedom and liberty for all, Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the San Bernardino City Unified School District 
declares February 2018 to be acknowledged in all district schools as a period of recognition of African American history as it relates to the history and the culture of our country and be it further resolved that the Board of Education encourages all the students of the district to undertake educational activities which commemorate the history and contributions of African American citizens and that this history be included and intertwined in all study all studies of history of the United States throughout the school year. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and vote. It's not, is it not working tonight? Oh, good. Yay. Okay. <clears throat> Two point five recognition of National School Counseling Week, Mr. Gallo. Thank you, Madam President. Recognition of National School Counseling Week. Whereas the theme of National School Counseling Week 2018 is school counseling, helping students realize their potential, and whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these traits relate to career awareness and development, and whereas school counselors are passionate about their commitment to helping students and are an integral part of the educational process that, that enables all students to achieve success in school. Therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and the Board of Education of the San Bernardino City Unified School District join the rest of the state and nation in recognizing February 5th through the 9th, 2018, as National School Counseling Week and encourage all of our schools to set aside this week to acknowledge the outstanding and selfless contributions that school counselors make to our students and our schools each and every day. So move. Second. Okay, any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, motion passes. That's 2.6, recognition of Ronald Reagan Day. Mr. Tillman? Uh, I'll defer to a, a uh, True Republican, Mr. Gallo, to no, no. Well, Lord, I can, or, I can or Scott. <laughs> Mr. Wyatt, Dr. Wyatt. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Recognition of Ronald Reagan Day. Beginning in 2011, February 6th of each year has officially been designated as Ronald Reagan Day in California. On February 6th, the San Francisco Unified School District joins other organizations in towns and cities across California in observing and recognizing the achievements of our 33rd governor and our nation's 40th president. Whereas Ronald Wilson Reagan was born on February 6, 1911, and served as California governor from 1967 to 1975, and whereas Ronald Reagan was a humble man who worked throughout his life in advance to public good, having been employed as an entertainer, union leader, corporate spokesman, California governor, and president of the United States, and Whereas known for his small town values of hard work, tolerance, and the importance of education, Ronald Reagan was sworn in as the nation's 40th president on January 20th, 1981, and continued to serve until 1989, a period when our nation experienced unprecedented economic growth and prosperity, military strengthening, establishment of new diplomatic allies abroad, and a resurgence of national pride. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the San Mario City Unified School District encourages all district schools to undertake educational activities on February 6, 2018, which commemorate the life and accomplishments of Ronald Reagan. So move. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Let's go ahead and vote. Okay, motion carries. I just want to um, caution us. I had a t I received a text saying that Dr. Hill is watching us from her hospital bed, so we better <laughs> act right. <laughs> and I'm glad you mentioned Dr. Hill. Dr. Uh, Hill too is late, not Danny. <laughs> she's not she's not with us right now. She um, is not feeling so well, and so we want to keep her in her prayers. Keep us in our and keep her in our prayers, and uh, for a fast recovery. I also want to mention uh, Assembly Member, Assemblywoman Eloise Reyes, Gomez Reyes, is having an unveiling for the Rosa Parks statue, which is uh, Friday, February the 2nd, 10.30 a.m., off of uh, Rosa Parks State Memorial Building, 464 West 4th Street, San Bernardino. For those who would like to attend, I think it would be a great event. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass this to the board members. Okay. 
We're going to go. We're going to go ahead and move to 3.0 administrative report 3.1. Annual audited financial report for fiscal year 2016-2017. Thank you, Madam President. And so uh, with that, Mr. Christakos will provide us a, a report, brief report on the annual audit financial report as well as an update uh, regarding the uh, governor's 2017-18 pr budget proposal. So thank you, Mr. Christakos. So I have Ms. Shiloh Gorospi. She's a partner with Vavronik Trine and Day, and she will give the report on the audit. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. And as usual, when I um, summarize the results of the audit, um, I'm open to any questions. If you would like to stop and interrupt me during the presentation, or if you want to hold your questions to the end, um, feel free to jump in anytime. So as you are aware, tonight we're presenting the audit for the year ended June 30, 2017. Uh, our audit, of course, is um, designed for us to provide you with a level of assurance about whether or not the financial statements is presented or materially stated. So our report starts on page two. That is our independent auditor's report. It's our opinion about the financial statements presented tonight. And this opinion is an unmodified opinion. It means that as presented here in the financial statements, we do believe that the um, financial statements are materially stated based on our audit. Now, we don't just provide you an opinion on the financial statements themselves. If I can direct your attention to page 105, there are three other reports embedded within this document. And this page does a nice job summarizing those, so I'll go through this for you um, next. In addition to the unmodified opinion on your financial statements, we provide you with a report on internal control over financial reporting. And this report is designed to communicate any internal control deficiencies that rise to the level of what we would refer to as either a significant deficiency or a material weakness. And tonight, we are not reporting any material weaknesses. However, we did identify a significant deficiency that is detailed beginning on page 106. And in addition, there was no non-compliance that was identified that was material to the financial statement. So um, we don't give you an opinion on internal controls. We just report our findings related to internal controls. In addition to that, we have a report for you on federal compliance, federal programs. This is mandated by the federal government that programs be audited. You can see the programs that were audited about mid middle of the page. And this is both a compliance um, opinion as well as a report on internal control. And so this is an unmodified opinion. So once again, that is a clean report, highest level of assurance uh, that we can provide. And there were no findings of noncompliance. There were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control. So the federal report is a clean report. And last but not least, we provide you a report on state programs, once again mandated by the state to audit various programs. And this is an unmodified opinion as well on most of the programs. There were a couple um, programs as listed at the bottom of page 105 with which we did have um, some findings noted. And those, once again, are summarized in the um, next few pages beginning on page 109. Now, there was one other page I did want to um, bring to your attention. If you would turn to page 90, I always like to just touch base with you regarding you know, what information as a board member might you want to go to if you wanted to just kind of get a bigger picture of, of this 100 plus page document and the financial um, status of the district. And so this is just kind of a good summary. It's a three year trend of financial information. And it also shows you projections for the upcoming year. What I will say about this is when you look at 2018, bear in mind that this was as of June. So we're way into 2018 now. The governor has modified the budget and there's new information that's already <coughs> become available that plays into that. So don't don't focus so much on those numbers in this report. This was a different time and we're in a different place. But um, obviously at this point, you know, you can see how in 2018 there was at that time 
um, deficit sp spending projected. However, some of that relates to carryover of, of funds from prior years. Um, but like I said, that budget is different today than it was when this report was presented. So just keep that in mind. Overall, as you can see, the past three years, um, there has not been deficit spending. So, so that's a good trend to see. And of course, in addition to the report, you've received a letter from us that is um, not part of the bound report. It is a separate communication. It is addressed to you as the board members. This is our report that we like to provide you uh, because it gives you some information outside of the report itself that we believe is pertinent in communicating. The two I'll bring to your attention are if we had any disagreements with management while conducting our audit or if we had any difficulties in completing the audit, we would like to bring that to your attention and we do so in the form of this letter. But as you read through that letter, hopefully you'll see that no such um, issues occurred. So uh, nothing to be alarmed about with that letter, um, but we do still provide that to you to tell you we didn't have any problems. So. Okay, so if there are any questions or any specific pages you would like me to address, I'm happy to do so. Yes, Mr. Tillman? Yeah, just on page um, 106, and I already talked to um, Ms. Christakis, I called her earlier about the concern I had with the finding that um, talks about the um, district accrued liabilities in excess of the amount owed. And I guess, Jenny, so the, the, the next question for me is this $5 million that was overestimated. What's, what makes up that $5 million? In, Okay. So, um, <clears throat> 1.6 million of it was an over accrual of utilities, telephone, and electricity. Um, when we dug into that, we found that we actually spent a million less in electricity last year. And so that should have been caught at the close. There's thousands and thousands of accruals that go on, very small amounts through at the, in between June and July. And then the telephone bill, I think, was the other one that was off about 400000 um, The other amounts, Mr. Tillman, were in the bond fund and also in the developer fee fund. And part of it, if I'm correct, is the um, cash awaiting deposit that occurred um, between us and the county prior to July 1. So for me, the, 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 I know some of the funds, are, if it's in the building fund, I'm assuming it's restricted money. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the big question for me is how much of that money is um, uh, unrestricted? And then is this, is this the area you check every year? Or so if this, if this had happened in 2016, you would have caught it in 2016 also? Absolutely. And, and just so that way you can have a point of reference to um, the details that Janie was mentioning, if you turn to page 89, this actually breaks it down for you um, by the different funds and the amounts that are applicable to each of the different funds. And so all of the money in the building fund and capital facilities funds are restricted. So a lot of that really relates to the timing of completed work. So as you know, with construction projects, you have a contract. Um, oftentimes at the end of the year, the contract is partway through. Maybe you don't have an invoice from a vendor yet and you're waiting to know exactly how much on that contract you owe at the end of the year. If you don't know, you have to estimate. So it's, it's a lot of times not that the money isn't earmarked for that purpose. It's just a matter of was it spent in June or was it spent in July, August, or September. But it really is related to specific type of contracts when it relates to those construction funds. So those monies are tied specifically to those projects um, anyways from the beginning, and they are all restricted. So in relation to your question on the audit, every year we do absolutely, this is a, um, an area that we consider to be of higher risk. Um, and just to give you a little bit of um, background on what we do is we develop dollar expectations or what we refer to as um, our tolerable thresholds of, of misstatement. Uh, it's our materiality. That's in our world what we, what we call it. And we always, we don't disclose what our materiality, what those dollars are to the district because we don't want the district to be able to work within that realm and, and 
you know, mess with the financial statements under our per, um, um, amounts that we consider to be significant. So we don't tell the district what our dollar amounts are. And we, we look at everything that exceeds our, our um, idea of what would be material to the users. And so when issues come up, and, and bear in mind an audit, the goal, to ensure there's no material misstatements. We can't catch everything. We're not gonna catch all the you know, smaller type of errors that might be out there. But our goal is material. So we focus on establishing thresholds and looking at everything that is material. And that's why um, we're able to provide you with these adjustments this year. We would have done the same exact testing in the prior year. So um, you know, it could very well be a result of just the closeout process and the timing that's allowed during the closeout process. Maybe there was a lot more uh, paperwork to process and some things just slipped through the cracks this year. It's tough to say, but there are, there are reasons. We, we definitely don't believe these were intentional um, errors, meaning the district wasn't um, trying to over accrue uh, on purpose. We definitely, in the course of our testing, um, felt it was more just unintentional errors. So um, we, we do look into that, the purpose or the, we refer to as the qualitative factors that go into that um, type of a situation to make sure that you know, no one's trying to um, manipulate by over-recording or under-recording um, certain types of entries. All right, thank you. Dr. Flores? Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I want to follow up with uh, what Mr. Tillman also brought up. I would like to know why it happened, and um, because a $1.2 million mistake on telephones is, and electricity is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. That's so. a lot of money. And um, you know, I, I, you know, just for benefit of a doubt, I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but that, I mean, to have almost $6 million uh, you know, ov overestimated is not good practice. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to know why it happened and how are we going to correct it so that, you know, we uh, don't do this again. So the, that's a lot of money, $6 million. Yep. Yeah. So um, the money under the building fund on page 89, the adjustment, it's like Ms. Gorosby said, things were, we thought were going to be uh, paid or accrued, so work that was done. We thought it was gonna be June, and it happened in, later than June. So that's just the timing. It was, the first, oh, it was timing, okay. Mm -hmm. and the but first what about the electricity? So the electricity, as we went through everything, um, we've been spending about a 9 million, 9.2 million electricity, and we spent 1 million less last year. Mm -hmm. So when they went to accrue it, they accrued the full PO and should have prorated that. It wasn't intentional, just um, they didn't know. Is, was June going to come in a lot higher? And so they wanted to be safe and ensure that they could oh, cover okay. that. So we're going to adjust it down. What I found out as well is we've um, installed 800 push-to-start thermostats, and that and some of the our participation in the summer discount program and some other things have lowered some of our rates, mm -hmm. some of those peak rates, because we've stayed that's out of the good. peak rates. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we saved a million in electricity. So we'll adjust that uh, budget down. Okay. We will also show in the second interim the savings from this um, and bring it to the board at second interim. And then the phone was, I think, 400,000 less. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and what, I about don't have the rest, what about the rest of the money um, that adds up to almost six million? So uh, were those just minor? Um, I would okay. consider them to be more more minor. There there were a couple. So there's an amount in the general fund, and if you look at if you're looking at page 89, it's that cash awaiting deposit. So what this is is, you know, monies that come in and are ready to be deposited, um, but they haven't. Quite, they're like in, they're in transit. They haven't quite hit the bank yet. They haven't quite um, been recorded on the books, and so it's in process of being recorded. So those were really um, deposits that were on hand, ready for processing, but just hadn't quite um, been recorded yet that needed to be recorded. So that's that piece. Um, 
And then in the, in the remaining, the non-major governmental funds, that's kind of an aggregate of a few different things that all kind of break down to smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, I can't tell you all the pieces of it, but you know, clearly we could get you some of the, those details if that's necessary. Um, but just to go back to the utilities, and this isn't uncommon where at the end of the year, um, you have to do some estimation because you don't have a vendor invoice or you don't have right. um, those details. But there are things you can do to mitigate that. For example, you could call the vendors and say, hey, we don't have an invoice yet. We don't know. Can you give us an idea of what the bill's going to be? Um, so those are some things that can happen in the future to make sure that we're more diligent in, in getting a better estimate of what that final bill is going to be. So my question then next is, have we uh, balanced the sheet? I mean, out of that $6 million that was overly uh, estimated, how much of that did we have to pay uh, our vendors and so forth? So um, the, the part that we didn't have to pay is the phone and the electricity. electricity. So that's going to provide more funding this year. So for rest, our balance yeah. um, sheet, that would be $1.6 million then. One point. That we would... Okay, um, so that we would now have an additional 1.6 million for and, our and our then the cash added. deposit won't be right. um, any extra money in the budget. The other part are in the building funds, so they it's just was the timing that'll of stay when the there. Work was yeah, done. yeah, okay. so that will stay there. Um, so what I think, Jim, if I'm correct, there there's like 31,000 lines, 41,000. You'll see there's differences of eight dollars, nine dollars that accrued. To, yeah, and so. Okay. Um, in large accounts, yeah, they need to call, and I think they do. Um, it's just the timing, a short amount of time that staff has to close out all those um, balances and get everything accrued in order to close the books and, and get the unaudited actuals done. And so we're driven also by county timelines, and, so, and we're big, so it just... We're going to do our best. We're doing an after action review where we can just take a look at some. So of you're in the process of closing those accounts so that we'll know. Um, is that correct? The utility and the phone? <clears throat> yes, and all the other ones? Or are all the other ones already closed? So um, we know through the close that we um, miscalculated what the phone and the electricity would be. So that money will fall out into the budget. Right. But I'm asking you for the remainder, the ones that were uh, overestimated, have all those accounts been closed? So it and, takes, and bills paid? So the bills continue to be paid. It, um, there are timelines with the county that you cr uh, clear the accruals, and I don't have that right in front of me, but they, the county is pretty diligent about ensuring that all districts clear their accruals, and some happen right in July and August, and others take you know a couple months. Okay. But it's part of their oversight with us. Okay. And uh, I'll, oh, sorry. No, I just, you know, to, to me, this the only this is a concern for me because just in terms of our projects, I think we're overly conservative. I mean, um, you do other schools, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when I when I see that, you know, we're projecting a lower revenues in 2018 than 2017 and this you talked about deficit spending i'm glad you didn't harp on it because in the end we never do it uh for the most part if we look at the trend historically you'll see that but um to me i just get a concern about not having money available to at, that in the end is going to be available to be spent and if you if you start from the beginning saying that you have less revenue and if it turns out to be substantially less then that's that much money that we didn't get to spend on the kids that are in school right now. So I don't know. To me, it'd be great if we could have some way of knowing, you know, what's driving those areas, so that we can um, have more confidence in spending more of the money that we have available to us. Because uh, every year we we project this huge, like on this page, where it shows uh, uh, a deficit deficit spending of. But $15 million, it's not going to happen. But if, if, if it doesn't happen, um, I don't get to spend that money because then Jenny and I for next year, it might be $30 million going to project, but it doesn't happen. So I don't know how we find a balance. I, I don't want to, I can't say I'm not going to listen to you because they're the ones who tell me how much money I have to spend. I have to listen to them. But it would just be nice to find some way to 
um, just give us access to more of that money to spend so we can spend on the kids. Um, Shiloh, do you have where you can show, um, so we had one-time dollars, um, so the difference in the one-time dollars and then the federal, the unearned dollars, and so um, part of the reason that happens with federal dollars, if you don't spend it all, then you can't account for the revenues. Right. And so maybe that would be helpful. Yeah, that, and that could be part of it. So there are some um, rules with when you can recognize the revenue. So it really is driven, a lot of uh, your restricted dollars are driven off of when the money is spent. So if you don't spend it, you don't recognize the revenue. Um, it's dollar for dollar in terms of revenue and expense. Um, but I think a bigger function of this really is centered around the governor's budget and what information is available at each of the budget periods. And as we all know, that continues to change from one period to the next. In prior years, we've had a lot of um, one-time money, one-time money, one-time money, where you, the district can't anticipate, and then all of a sudden, you know, you come May of that fiscal year that's almost over, there's you know, additional one-time monies or, or significant changes to the budget from the state that now the districts have to account for. But I would say that what the districts try, most districts, because you did talk a little bit about we do, most districts, what they try to do is focus on what the projections are that, that come about at each reporting period, and they'll use the governor's budget and all the advice that comes from the county, because the county is the oversight when it comes to budgeting, making sure all your assumptions are accurate. So they change. They change at adopted, they change at first interim, they change at second interim. And as long as the district is staying within the realm of, of those recommendations from the county based on the state. We, we use the governor's projections when they're bad. <laughs> okay, we, right now, if we, if, we, if we had got a word that we were gonna get the amount of money taken away that he's projecting to give us, right. we'd have a special meeting right now and talk about how we're gonna make all these cuts. Yeah. But he's, he's projecting to give us new money. It's looking a little better now. It's so second better. interim, I do believe that that will be reflected for yeah. you. But Jenny won't talk a lot about that. <laughs> she, <laughs> I'm just having fun. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough process, budgeting. It's, it's, it's tough. All right. Well, thank you so much. For, any other questions? If not, we're going to go ahead and move forward. Thank you so much thank for your you. presentation. So we're going to go ahead. Okay, yeah, board, you'll vote on that in consent items. And then we're going to go ahead and have uh, Ms. Christakos. Will you be speaking on the budget, or is this after? Thank you. It's all doom and gloom. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, let me um, hold on one moment. I apologize. Excuse me. Oh, as you're aware, the governor came out with his January, gov uh, the governor's January budget proposal, and you know, his promise was to fund LCFF over the next eight years. Our economy's been doing really well. Um, before we jump into the governor's budget, just broadly, the Federal Reserve, you know, has raised their rates over several times in 2017 and is anticipated to continue that in 2018, although these rates continue to be at historic lows. The stock market continues to soar and the U.S. gross domestic product continues steady growth. When we look at California, it is slowing down. The combination of good job markets and constrained housing markets has combined to slow growth in the state. However, given the tight labor market, employee, employers will likely continue to raise pay to attract and retain workers with hourly wages also rising to the statutory annual increase in minimum wage and the unemployment gap continues to close. California's at about 4.8. So overall, things continue to look well. Let's look at what the governor has uh, for us. So the governor have fully funds LCFF. Um, San Bernardino City Unified School District will see 15 million more than projected at first interim for 2018-19. And so if you'll Remember, LCFF, we were 97% funded. By 2021, we were going to be fully funded, and he has accelerated the funding. So 
instead of waiting till 2021, he's proposing in 1819 that we would be 100% target. But that also means, well, it won't be target anymore, 100% funding, that years after that, unless there's some work to really increase the base and provide some more adequate funding, that the district will receive COLA only. So we'll be done with the, um, the extra money to fund LCFF because we'll be fully funded. So the great news is we have that 15 million two years earlier than we projected. He proposed one-time mandate funding of $295 per student. That's about $13.7 million for our district. Um, we're hearing this could change. It might be something more restricted in the past. He created like the educator effectiveness, so we'll be watching for the May revise. Um, he's proposing additional funding for childcare and preschool in the form of extra slots strong workforce program to establish a K-12 specific component, and really working on the teacher workforce to increase, increase and retain special education teachers. The last three bullets, we just are waiting for the trailer bills on that. We don't have a lot of information. We know what they're setting aside isn't a lot for the whole state. In fact, the special education um, teacher portion is 100 million for the whole state, and so, when you look at LCFF funding, that was about $3 billion. So it's not a lot, but we look forward to see what, um, what he's going to provide for us, and it's a much-needed area. So what's not in the education budget? The 2000, um, well, increasing the, ba the base grant target. So we know that 35 years ago, California was fifth in the nation in per-pupil funding. And currently, even with the full funding of LCFF, we're still near the bottom, the bottom 10% of the nation. And so um, our collective voices in um, really pursuing more funding for the base funding for all districts and for all students is something that we'll focus on over the next couple of years. Um, there were no additional uh, funding for the increased obligations under CalSTRS and CalPERS no extra funding for home to school transportation or AB 602, which is the funding we use for special education. Some of the budget challenges as we uh, look, look ahead is the governor warned, um, be careful of California's volatile tax structure. Um, he shared concerns about the potential impact of the recent federal tax reform um, and then just that LCFF in the future will be COLA only to cover all of our ongoing statutory costs and that California remains in the bottom 10% of per pupil spending. And then the next um, slide is Governor Brown reminding us that there have been 10 economic recessions since the 1950s and it's a matter of time before the 11th occurs. The next slide um, you've all seen before, it just illustrates we're going to update the out years with the second interim with the increased COLAs, but as you get to a COLA only environment, um, it's not enough to cover step and column, PERS and STRS health and welfare. So we'll have to look at other ways to fund some of these items and um, I'll, I have some ideas that we'll share in a bit. The next slide shows the purchasing power under the LCFF. The promise was that no local education agency would receive less than their 2012-13 funding and that by 2021 the purchasing power would be pre, uh, restored to pre-recession levels. The red line illustrates the additional costs that local education agencies have related to the increased cost of PERS and STRS. So we actually have lost purchasing power. And then on the next slide, um, I always like to recommend the most positive way to increase funding so we can sustain our programs. And of course, our goal to meet the 97% attendance rate, not only will have provide um, more instructional days for our students, but additional funding. A 1% increase in ADA is 5.3 million. And um, we also will encourage Saturday school to make up for any of those missed days. As we move to the next slide is just the, in the short term, what we have coming, we'll be bringing the March, uh, the second interim report to you in March. We'll bring an update on the governor's May revise. 
and we do not expect that he will change the full funding for LCFF. This is his legacy, and he, he, he's going out of office next year, so we fully anticipate that we will receive those dollars. And then, of course, the public hearing and the budget adoption in June. Thank you, Ms. Christakos. Um, Danny Tillman. Mr. Stockett, I know um, the whole thing with the local control funding formula is fully funded now, but we're still part. They still we still part of Prop 98, right? So yes. if something were to happen and the state received more money, there is a possibility that the governor could decide to give schools additional money. It just be he'd have to decide how he, how he was going to do it, right? Yeah, I think um, what he's done is done uh, that through one-time funding. They found ways through this um, LCFF to say this is it, but he does have the ability right. to do that. Right. And we really need to advocate for that base funding. Um, Dr. Flores and I were at a workshop yesterday and just the, the talk around no matter where a kid goes to school, they sh we should all be prepared to meet their needs. And with the base funding as it is, at the lowest in the nation, it's not adequate. We're trying to find good terminology to use. Uh, they often don't want to hear about adequacy, but that's what it's about. So the formula has addressed equity. It has redistributed funds, and um, we're so grateful for that. Our students deserve that. We know that um, the population that um, that gets more funding through LCFF, the low income English learner and foster youth. We know those dollars are greatly needed and um, we just now need to build up that base so all kids get what they need. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Flores. Uh, Madam President, um, I just wanted to tell the board and the public, um, Ms. Christakos did an incredible job yesterday with the uh, state of finances, uh, finances in um, our new budget and so forth, uh, I really appreciate the the diligence and the detail and just the comprehensiveness of, of that. And what one of the takes that um, one of the highlights of it were, you know, public should know that even though we're getting all of this money, uh, the governor and the legislator legislature have now given us the responsibility and ab obligation to also use that money for, um, you know, which I, I, I think it's, it's for us to do for um, PERS and STRS, uh, health and welfare. So it looks like we were getting all this money, but in fact we're not because our obligations, um, we should be taking away uh, what our obligations are to really see what is the total amount that we're getting and in terms of equity uh, You know they may say that that we've met equity, but I don't think so uh, I don't think we've met the equity challenge nor the base challenge We're 47th in the nation in terms of funding our kids. That is pathetic that is terrible and so we somehow have to, you know, tell our legislators that, you know, w some kind of plan, devise a plan to increase the base, increase uh, the equity funds for, um, for what we need to do, the investment. I always think about investment in our, our children and our kids in terms of education. And we do have the research and the data th that the more educated they are, that they go up higher in, in the pay scale. <clears throat> and then also contribute to their communities and to the state of, of uh, the health of, of our economy. And uh, California is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. And so anyway, I, I, I really appreciated all that you did yesterday. And, um, and so board, you know, it looks like we're getting all this money, but in fact, we're not uh, because of our responsibilities and obligations, which I think is okay, because I mean, uh, we do have to invest in our teachers, long-term pensions and the health and of our employees and, and our classified. So um, anyway, I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Uh, there's a student board member that had her light on before Mr. Tillman did, uh, Ms. Schulby. 
Uh, do you mind explaining to me the third bullet point on the budget challenges slide? It says that uh, it discusses future increases to the local control funding formula, but previously it was stated that um, LCFF was fully funded, and I'm not sure uh, what COLA only means or what step and column means, so if you could clarify what those are, that would help me a lot. So our new uh, revenue source is now called local control funding yeah. formula, so the LCFF. So what this bullet says, and perhaps I could have written it better, is future increases to LCFF will be just COLA, so cost of living adjustment. And so that's determined um, what we've been receiving for the past six years, five years, is we've been receiving increased funding to get to that full right. LCFF. So 2018-19 okay. will be fully funded, and then thereafter, unless what you know, Mr. Tillman referred to, if they decide to fund us more, mm -hmm. give us more money, but otherwise we'll just get cost of living each year. Okay. And what was your other question? Oh, per oh I know what those are, or I think I step do. Step and column? Yeah. So per, uh, step and column. Um, we have employees that work in the district, all the teachers and classified, and, all, and they are placed on a specific step on the salary schedule and a column based on different things. So for a teacher, based on education and experience. And then as they work in the district over time, they move up a step, or if they get more education, they move over a column and earn more money through their... Um, um, so this just credit. refers to salary yes. for staff in the district. Okay. Mm -hmm. And make sure you get a copy of the, like the MOU for one of the. The what? For, get a copy of the, the MOU, the memorandum of understanding for, like the teachers or classified employees, because you'll actually see the actual oh, columns. Okay. So yes. you can get that from uh, Dr. Right. Wiseman, and then the the step and the column become real obvious to you because you okay. literally look at a different column, if you have. For instance, um, a master's degree, then you'll, your pay may increase by 2% or 2.5%. Okay. So. so this is a, ch a budget challenge because we would rather have the increase cover these other factors instead of just the cost of living adjustment. So a cost of living adjustment um, doesn't cover all of the right. increased obligations. So the state uh, required retirement the CalPERS and CalSTRS <coughs> districts don't elect to be, right. you know, out of it. So those increased costs exceed what the COLA provides for. Okay. I was just, I just wanted to clarify how that was Great a question. challenge. Thank you. Question. All right. Thank you so much Wait. for your questions. Before, we didn't have to pay the PERS and STRS. Districts did not have to pay for it. The state did for their pensions. We paid, um, we paid, but it was a much lower Minimal. amount. And then um, the state was underfunded in these pensions, and that's when the cost went up. <clears throat> Mr. Tillman? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, because we've gone through so many in the past bad years, I still want to just say this is still, for, as far as I'm concerned, great news that we've gotten so much additional funding. There's no way around it. I mean, to think, if you would have told me five years ago that in five years our funding would increase by 80%, I would tell you that's unbelievable, and, and that's literally what's happened. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think we've gone from like $6,000 a student to almost $11,000 a student, right? I think um, during the recession we were at about, um, in 2007-8, I think all of our funding was maybe $350 million, and it's six hundred and doubled, yeah. yeah. So well, the state funding has gone up, I think, 40-some percent, so yeah. it's quite significant. Substantial, yeah. Yes. So, and, too, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that we're very fortunate that we live in a district that has received a lot of, has benefited from the local control funding formula. Now, it makes sense that we do because a lot of our students have um, needs that, that warrant the additional funding, but that wasn't always the case. And there are a lot of districts that um, look at us in envy because we're getting so much of that funding. And that battle is not going to go away. You're going to have, and I hear it whenever I go to, to the conferences, you hear about districts who are upset that 
this is like ours are getting so much more money than they are. And that's always going to be a battle. And that's why it's critical for the board to make sure we spend the money uh, appropriately and in a way that makes a difference that people can see. Because they're always going to look for excuses and reasons to say that San Bernardino shouldn't get as much funding as they're getting. And that's why I advocate for let's look at where we are as a nation, um, as a state compared to the nation. The base funding needs to be um, increased so that we're not looking at each other and saying, I should have that dollar, no, you should have that dollar. It should be, we all deserve higher funding for our students of California. And, and I gotta say, um, I, I know no one ever dreamed that their rainy day fund would be as large as it is right now. I think the rainy day fund is up to what? Six billion dollars? Uh, that's a lot of money sitting there in that fund. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Tillman. Any other questions by the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and move to 3.2, bully prevention and intervention. Oh wait, before, um, I just realized it's, it's close to seven o'clock and we have public comments. So I'll go ahead and ask the students before we go, move there to have our student board members maybe speak. And uh, we're gonna move to item 4.0 for student board members comments. Ms. Shelby. My comments today will be uh, more informative than in uh, several meetings, I suppose, uh, because I'll be reporting on the activities of the Student Advisory Council from their meeting uh, last Friday. Um, so what we are currently doing in the Advisory Council is preparing uh, proposals to bring before the board. That's to my knowledge, scheduled to occur on February 20th. So I will happily answer general questions about that, but you will be seeing presentations uh, by other members of the council um, at that meeting, so I won't go into too much detail. But uh, we have proposals in five different areas. We have building relationships, youth court, community pride, campus involvement, and peer mentorship. And we have uh, small teams of students, of high school students from across the district working on each of those. And we're sending um, delegations from each team to present to you. And we'll have uh, PowerPoints. And we will uh, be presenting those proposals for potential district policies based on uh, how we see to improve those areas. Um, we have one more meeting on February 9th to finish that up. but we. Like I said, we do plan to present on February 20th. Um, I, the efforts that I've seen on that so far have been really, really in, in depth and really committed. I think they're gonna be really interesting um, and potentially very impactful for the district. Uh, we, we'll be presenting like specific proposals for that. I'm in the campus involvement group, I won't like give away too much about that, but I'm excited. I know the people in the community pride group have already begun planning how to implement their idea, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I also, this is not strictly related to the Student Advisory Council. I um, am attempting to survey uh, various high schoolers across the difference, the district, uh, so that I can more properly represent them in this job. I don't have enough responses yet to report on that, but I'm trying. Uh, next, I want to talk about, I, bl I believe I mentioned this at a previous meeting, but Assembly Bill 261, which was passed recently, which states a couple different things relating to um, the duties and the rights of student board members. Uh, the first, I believe, we're already fulfilling here, which is that the student board members already have have the right to access all the materials that are given to board members at these meetings, which I think we're already doing. But the other part of that legislation that I would draw the board's attention to is that the student board members have the right to a, a preferential vote, I believe it is termed, before the, bo the board votes on agendized items. So it wouldn't be counted in the vote total, but it would show uh, the person's preference. Um, and I don't, currently know if there's a mechanism to do that. I know the voting takes place later in the meetings than many of us stay, but I would be willing to discuss how to 
make sure we're properly um, following the, the rules set by that legislation. Um, and that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move to session five, public comments. This is a time during the agenda when the Board of Education is prepared to receive comments from members of the public on any matter within the subject matter jurisdiction. Other than to ask a clarifying question, the Board will not make any responses to comments made by the public. If needed, we will refer to the superintendent to follow up. We ask that you keep your comments to five minutes or less. If there are more than six people, six comments on one topic, you will be allotted a time no more than 30 minutes. Okay, Dr. Marsden. Thank you, Madam President. We do have a few comments from our, our public. We have one comment under agenda item 7.20. So when we get to that, it's under consent items. Uh, we'll ask the member of the public once the board has opened that item for discussion and staff has had a chance to comment, then we'll ask for the public comment. Uh, staff will continue to comment where necessary and answer the board's questions, and then uh, you'll c continue with your vote. Uh, with that, we'll welcome, at this point, uh, Ms. Uh, Vanessa Kaijoy to give us an update on Hardy Brown Coll College Prep update. Welcome. Happy New Year, uh, President Medina and Superintendent Marsden and board members. Uh, Vanessa Kaigoy, Coordinator of Compliance for Fortune School of Education, representing Hardy Brown College Prep. I have two things for um, you guys to share. This is for our Quarantine Practices Academy that we are rolling out this year. And Margaret Fortune, who is our CEO, uh, wanted us to share those with you all to see what our parents at Hardy Brown will be going through. So the first Parenting Practices Academy will be taking place on February 28th. And the second one is happening on March, Saturday, March 17th. So we did two formats, one on a weekday. It's really long, so we do provide coffee and dinner by, um, and childcare for both the Saturday and the Wednesday session. Wednesday session goes from 2.30 to 7 p.m. And the Saturday session will start at 8 a.m. and go until 12.30 p.m. So within the tabs, you'll see there's parenting practices videos. And we partnered with Dr. Fortune's company, Fortune & Associates, and that's who's putting this together. And he actually has a series of videos that we, um, we got. We purchased codes for all of our families in our charter school network and so that they could go and watch these videos on attendance and you know, Common Core, whether it be ELA, math, uh, NGSS, science. But the biggest um, pull or the biggest focus on this is one of our organizational priorities this year is actually attendance. And what we found is that kindergartners, a lot of them miss school because a lot of parents feel as though it's not as you know, crucial for them to come to school. But this actually tells them opposite of, um, of that. And so we actually are targeting, we want all of our families to come, but we are targeting our kindergartners, our new families to um, Hardy Brown, as well as any chronically truant students. So I know that we have our SART meetings scheduled in the next two weeks for a few of our students. and. Uh, the principal, Ms. Allen, said that she would probably be inviting them to parent, uh, the Parenting Practices Academy. So you'll also see um, all the different topics that we go over and we bring our presenters in. This is actually one of the fun parts of my job because I get to present on the importance of parent involvement. Um, but you'll also see the book on the, back, on the back cover. It's also in Spanish as well. So we're really working on making sure that we have um, Spanish translation at all of our parent meetings this year. So this is a piece of that. And wow. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Just seeing that, it's, it's uh, as a parent and as a parent advocate back in the day, it, this is really refreshing. And mm -hmm. we definitely need to take note on this. And this is a great example of what parent engagement looks like. So thank you for bringing that. Um, Ms. Rogers? How long did it take you all to put it together? So from what I know, we, we did Parent Academy mm -hmm. last year, right. but it was not this in-depth. Okay. Um, Margaret and Dr. Fortune spent 
months. Have you rolled it out at any other location? Uh, yes, so worth? we have 15 different um, dates. Mm -hmm. Have them all in my head. And we actually rolled them out at three of our schools, one of our middle schools mm -hmm. up north. And we actually have a big enroll registration at our school that we're doing it on Saturday. Okay, good. Very impressive. And then my last question is I saw in there referencing to the videos. So are those videos, they come and watch the video or do you, do they actually get this or this is just our inside look as to what's taking place? So what we did was they are, they got little cards on mm -hmm. the instructions on how to register for the videos. And okay. They got a little video code. Okay. And we passed those out the week that the students came back to school. Okay. And we told the parents, we sent out school messengers saying, hey, these codes are in your child's backpack. Be sure to pull them out so that you can watch them. And those videos are available for all of our parents, whether or not they come to the Parenting Practices Academy. Okay. Um, however, they did format it to where they could watch it on their cell phones, they okay. could watch it on a tablet, based on the LCAP survey that we did last okay. year as to how do our parents access the internet at home? Great job, great job. Oh, thank, thank you, you for much. updating thank us, appreciate that. Have a great night. Yeah, I wanted to mention the same thing. It, you know, you hear a lot of times about charter schools being places where there's innovation and maybe, maybe other schools can learn something from it. So I hope this is something we can take a look at with you and, and see how we might strengthen our own work. So thank you. Definitely contact me if you have any questions. Wonderful, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next comment is by uh, Miss Angie Montpass. Welcome. Good evening, board members, Dr. Marsden. Good evening. Superintendents. Last school board meeting, my esteemed colleague Sandy Owen spoke eloquently on the topic of bullying. And I started thinking about ways that this issue could be solved. And there are many ways, but one in particular that <clears throat> seems obvious to me <laughs> would be communication. Um, through my tenure, I've witnessed firsthand lack of communication and outright miscommunication, which threatens cohesive working relationships. So. There have been instances that administrators, site administrators in particular, are told one thing, teachers are told another thing. Um, and it, it's very interesting that when presented with written documentation, either district policy or even ed code, that one or both are surprised because they've been told parts of something, not the whole picture. And so I think it's really important that everyone is on the same page, everybody. Um, site administrators, district personnel, teachers, uh, search, uh, classified staff, parents, everybody. Um, it would alleviate a lot of conflict, conflicts between these stakeholders. While on the topic of communication, it may behoove the district to consider changing the gamut online search engine because it's very difficult to use. It's not very user friendly and not easy to navigate. Um, and in the interest of transparency, in the interest of talking straight, of confronting reality and of getting better, I really ask that we could work on improving communication. And finally, Referring back to what I spoke on last month regarding the pressure being put on site administrators and teachers to decrease suspensions, I see that the community engagement plan under school, climate, and campus environment states all students will be educated in learning environments that are clean, safe, well-maintained, drug-free, and conducive to learning with a focus on reducing suspension, expulsion, citation, and chronic absenteeism rates. And while this sounds good, again, I am concerned that this may fan the flame toward more teacher shaming and bullying of teachers who are writing high-level referrals and suspensions. Um, please understand that we have to start holding these students accountable, even at the elementary level. We're not doing the students any favors by giving them multiple chances before any real consequences are awarded. Society will not do the same. A lot of these kids who are acting up, we know, as, as classroom teachers, we probably know the best of anybody why this is happening. Some, they're having issues at home that we can't control. 
Others are so far behind, it's act, uh, acting out of frustration because they can't do the work at their grade level. So yeah, they're acting up so they're avoiding. But holding them accountable for their own actions is so very much important. We can't give five chances, five chances for some really big significant behaviors before we even consider suspending. And on the other end, we need to start thinking about ways that we're going to keep the standards high, have the kids reach those standards, not pushing the standards down. I want you to be thinking about this. I really think that we need to rethink this whole thing. I get the fact that LCAP monies are attached to lowering the suspension rates, but what's really happening here, everyone, is that the statistics are being manipulated. It's not real. I mean, the kids are still having issues, but the site administrators are being told you've got to lower the suspension rates, do anything you can, because their jobs are on the line. That's how they're being evaluated. I really, can <laughs> please consider changing this. This is not helpful at all. And there are kids whose educations are being held hostage as a result. Thank you. Just for clarification, I just want to make sure um, LCAP money is not tied to lowering uh, suspension rates. Uh, it isn't? Then no. I'm not sure why we're doing it because honestly, it really, it, it has to relate to, we have to actually hold the kids more responsible. Yeah, I'm just saying there's no money tied to... To lowering suspension rates at no, all? You said LCAP money. I can guarantee you just, there's no, well really, there is no LCAP money. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. So there's, there's, local, there's local control funding formula. Okay. And then we, the district uses general fund money to pay for things associated with LCAP, but there isn't any state mandated LCAP money. To lower suspension rates at all? It's not coming from the state at all? There is no, there's no, there's no and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Christophus, but there isn't any type of money designated for LCAP or, or extra money for lowering suspensions that I know of, is it? So LCFF is all of our funding, mm -hmm. and there are actions written in the LCAP that are supported through our funding. Mm -hmm. um, the state is monitoring, and we, um, Dr. Mitchell could respond to the rest of it, but. Um, the schools are not receiving money contingent upon their suspension rate. Okay, well that's good to know. And then Ms. Monpas, I just wanted to let you know, uh, Ms. Uh, Betis Alcala and I spoke after last meeting and we recognize in, in terms of your, your thought about communication, it's been a while since we've had a co-op meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, we bring together the exec board, cabinet, and really talk through some of these issues. And so we're committed to doing that. We already have a date secured and mm -hmm. we're looking forward to doing that soon. So well, I'm glad I to hear that. appreciate your time and we have heard you and thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mompas. The next comment is from uh, Nicholas Perez. Welcome. Mr. Perez, he is not here. Okay. Board welcomes uh, David Gyron or Gyron? Gyron. Good evening and welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody, uh, board members. Um, I'm here tonight because uh, I want to bring a subject. Uh, I know Cajon right now with the high school varsity team is doing it. How many of you guys uh, seen the Cajon wrestling team? I know I've seen him. Uh, have you seen where they practice? Have you guys? So he probably knows what I'm talking about. You know, every time I go see, I have my son, he's uh, in the wrestling team right now. Uh, Cajon right now this year, out of all the tournaments they've played, they've gone to four tournaments, and they've all four tournaments they've placed. Uh, the first tournament they took first place, second tournament they took third, and I believe the last two they they've taken third. Now they're competing with top teams, where their facilities, practice facilities are. I've seen some of them, and and they're they're awesome. I mean, they don't have to roll up no mats. They just come in, bathrooms, everything. Facility is great. So uh, I'm come here because uh, 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 sort of a complaint because you know I see these kids and the coach is working hard to always have a successful season. 
And so what I've noticed in the past three years, my son's been there since freshman, so I've seen this, and I know I should have come earlier. I know we have another parent that comes, and she comes out of here. And so, uh, but imagine this, you know, you come out of high, uh, your class, you go to your practice, first thing you gotta do is gotta roll up those mats. And then the facility where they're practicing, it's not even, a, it's half of a gym. And they're actually practicing like where the bleachers are. So you know, that you see the bleachers coming out and those bleachers are against the wall and that's where they practice. And they share that practice facility with the basketball courts and the basketball team. This year alone, they've already been uh, removed 20 times early. Now, every time they leave early from the, or dismiss uh, early is because of basketball or other functions. And I really don't think that's fair for them. After you know performing how much they've performed uh, throughout the past years. Now the coaches have been there all the time. Uh, Coach Jesse's been there for a long time. I don't know if you guys know him, but uh, uh, he's put a lot of time and he's very dedicated to this program. And I think it's a really effective problem, uh, program. So uh, I'm, I'm here to request funds if we could, uh, you know, I just hear all these funds, $6 million for the rainy day, you know, there's a lot of, maybe we could get some of that money to build them a facility. I know, you know, other sports, football is the big thing, money maker and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, uh, wrestling is as, as hard as football, you know, it it's, uh, actually it takes a stronger kid, you know, because you're, you're there, you know, you know, moving, wrestling hard, so. You know, it's as hard as they practice. Those kids practice as hard as, maybe if not the uh, more than the re the football players. So um, you know, I'm just here to request funds for them uh, to also get a more staff. You know, they're always a short staff. They have to uh, separate. I mean, if you got a good program, and it really is going to attract any sport. So you know, if 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 your program's great, whatever kids come, they're gonna, you know, like the program. So you need a strong program. And I believe the, the program they have now uh, is pretty strong, but they need those, those facilities. They really do need it. I mean, these kids out of practice, what they do is they mop the floor with chlorine, and then they roll those mats up to put them away because they're in the way. Uh, I know they just got two new mats, but they're already warning out. They're turning up because every time you bring them in, bring them out every day. So they wear down pretty bad. So, uh, and then bacteria, and then, you know, more ring warm with all these kids having all these problems. So it's unhealthy too. You know, it really is an unhealthy issue. So I would consider uh, if those board members to somehow help Cajon Wrestling, you know, Car Carter has a great gym. Redlands has a great gym for wrestling. All these other schools and other uh, um, districts, uh, you know, they have uh, pretty good gyms. Now, I haven't seen the other San Bernardino County gyms for wrestling, but, you know, I, I would ask for the more members to go visit the wrestling team and, and, and see it for yourself. Well, thank you, Mr. Giron. Is that how you say your name, Giron? Yeah. That's okay. Thank you so much. And I want you to know it's, it's your comments are heard, uh, and, and we are actively looking at how do we do these things, uh, obviously not just for Cajon, but you know, right. district-wide. What do we do? We meet with our athletic directors regularly. We have an athletic strategic plan. So Dr. Volkmer oversees that plan, our, my deputy superintendent, and so we'll continue to look at ways that we can do, uh, see what we can do in the future. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Tillman? So, it's just so clear. So you said that uh, if you had to point to the a site that you'd want our site to be like, you said it's Carter or Redlands. Which one? Um, Redlands has a nice facility. And do they have a, a totally separate building yes. for wrestling? They do. They do. And is it Redlands East Valley or Redlands High School? I believe it's uh, East, East, Val East, East, East Valley. All right, thank you. And, thank and you, you also, excuse me, uh, you also said Carter had a separate. Um, I believe they do. Uh -huh. uh, um, I know the, uh, the matches are in the basketball court, but they don't practice there. They have another mm -hmm. uh, building next to it. And it's not under the bleachers or anything, as, <laughs> you know, like we have here. So the concern, just to be clear, uh, the concern is um, just the facility that um, 
that is stable for them. Yeah, they clean will accommodate them. And clean and right. dedicated to just them. Yeah, because, you know, I see them every day after practice. They have to roll up these mats. Mm -hmm. and, you know, bacteria sits when it's right. warm and, and, and moisture, right? So, you know, they roll them back out. And, of course, they mop them with, uh, uh, with bleach. But, you know, I don't think that's kind of sanitary. Right, so. right. What you're talking about a practice facility then? No, you, the practice you, is what they have now. No, 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 no. I'm talking about because you said at Carter they actually have the tournaments and the regular basketball. Right, the the regular like the matches when they uh, go against other schools, they have it on a, on the regular basketball uh, court. basketball. But that's not where they practice. But they have a separate facility have you, to have practice. Have you seen their practice facility? I have not seen Carter's. I've seen Redlands. Seen Redlands. All right. okay. okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Right. White. Well, Mr. Drone, thank you again for coming today. And, um, you know, this goes back to the whole idea of our athletic strategic plan, and I know Dr. Volkmer is in charge of that, and, and I'll never forget one of the first lines I saw in that, and I refer to it all the time, and that is having world-class facilities. And that's going to stick in my mind forever, I'll be honest with you, because when I think world-class, um, to me that's an elite level of facilities. Right. And I've talked to some of the parents of the wrestling program, and yeah. I know some of them very well. I actually have family yeah. friends of mine as as well as our coach over there, right. and Mr. Embriani, the yes. ED. And they've actually been quite gracious and haven't asked for world-class facilities. They're just asking for like a building or a shed, and it took me back to my high school days. Right. And I, I remember we had the same concern with our wrestling program. I came from a school that was all about football. Yeah. And if you played any other sport, you were second and tertiary level, and wrestling was one of those sports, And um, but didn't have our own facility. So they, and I've, actually asked some of the parents to go look at it. You know what we built? We built a, a, a shed. It was an outdoor shed, which actually was our training facility, and that's all it was, was a shed. It wasn't <laughs> anything spectacular, yeah. but it was the wrestling building is what it was. Yeah. So the ownership there and the pride of it came into play and having their own place to practice. And, you know, I, I've talked about it not being that expensive. I don't think it'd be anywhere near having to build another facility or a building, per se, or no. to add on something. But it, it's an idea that I put you out there. You know, and there. it's a, in a, a, yeah. an investment. Like you guys, you, like everybody here mentions investment on your students, right? Well, it's, you know, that's part of it. You know, it's, it would be a good investment on your sports uh, programs and especially wrestling for Cajon, you know. And like you, as a parent, you know, we've, I've been fortunate to be up here and help make decisions for our district and our kids. And there are decisions, like you said, you wish you would have came earlier. Yeah. For me, many decisions will make, they'll never impact the kids that we have in school right now, but it may be years from now. So, you know, we have people like you to thank, even for kids and generations down the road. Right, right. Because we have to plant that seed somewhere, right. and we need to put that plan together and execute on that plan. I have seen the facilities. I know the, the, um, the mats don't even get to roll out all the way because no. they hold it up along yeah. the bleachers and that damages the mats as well. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, but that's where they're wrestling and, and we do have a um, phenomenal program over there. Right. You know, you're selling it short. I'll say it's outstanding actually. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but in the sense of equity, as I've heard, you know, up here, we need to look at all our facilities, all our programs, but mm -hmm. um, I know Cajon's definitely been on the radar. Yeah. Conversations I mean, it's pretty, I, so. it's pretty upsetting when they have to be kicked out I know. from their practice, you know, 20 times right after a big tournament you know against a rival of rival schools so, yeah, so I would say when you do look at facilities um, it's nice you bring up some of our neighboring districts but when I think world-class I want to know what that looks like world-class not well uh, average How's I'll, that? I'll be back then with that <laughs> so thank you all right thank you very much thank you I, I do have a clarifying question but this is for the district in regards uh, we have every high school has a wrestling team right Every high, school. Every high school has a wrestling team. And so any of our high schools has a facility? Okay. And then that would, because if we're going to do for one school, we can't just do one school. None, we would have our, to do all schools. Yeah, let me clarify that. None, none of our high schools have a dedicated facility strictly for wrestling. Okay. They say this is the, like the wrestling shed or the rest. Yeah. For practice. Yeah, and so then that's one thing that we always have to be mindful is that when you look at one facility, because I know we do have advocates from, from certain school sites, we have to look at it as a district-wide in, in making sure that we provide all our students those opportunities if that's something that we're going to push for. So thank you so much. Right. Yes. Ms. It would be, I, uh, Dr. Marsden, when you said you were going to look into it, did yes. that mean um, 
to see the cost, the cost yeah, so, of a dedicated you know, And this facility. is just a general overall approach is the comments with the athletic directors. So m six years ago, my first co I walked to a football game and the comments made to me by everybody in the public is when are we going to get new fields, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you hear from people all the time in all sports, depending on which sport you attend, everybody's just as passionate. And so that the athletic strategic planning team is, is, is looking at this methodically. Where do you start? What you can't, you can do anything you want. We can't do everything. That's been kind of the, the standard comment made mm -hmm. throughout this experience. And so we, we are in a good time. We're in a good place, and we're continuing to make uh, forward progress. Our goal is to have, as Mr. Dr. Wyatt mentioned, world class facilities, and that's really the effort behind our athletic strategic plan. So they are going through this. Dr. Volkmer is leading that team, and you know we we can see great outcomes already because of that effort, and I'm sure they're going to continue to be great out, out, outcomes ahead. I would like to be invited to that next athletic, yeah. That. I would like to be invited to the next athletic uh, director's meeting. There, um, there's sorry. two types of meetings, uh, Dr. Flores. <clears throat> we, have a, we have a monthly uh, meeting with the athletic directors to talk about technical type of stuff, eligibility, uh, current thing. Then we have what is called our athletic strategic plan implementation team. Okay. I think that would be, I mean, you're That's certainly welcome to That's the one I would to like go. to go yeah. to, yeah. So I'm just going to give it to you right so now. There's one this Friday. Is a, this is a great conversation, but I, it, you yeah. can give her the dates, of course, but um, we, if this would be maybe okay. a, even a conversation we can have as a board and what does this really look like All right. okay, across the district. So just send it to me. Thank you. Okay. So let's move along. There's other board comments. Yes, so those are all the comments. Now, again, we will have a comment from a member of the public under item 7.20 on a consent calendar. Uh, but until that time, Madam President, we can go back to um, item 3.2. Okay. So we're going back to 3.2, bullying prevention and intervention. The board will receive an update on the bully prevention and intervention policies, practices, and strategic <coughs> actions currently occurring in San Bernardino Unified School District. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, board, as you're aware, we've had a couple topics come up recently around bullying. Uh, and, and so we wanted to take some time to share not only with you, but with our public some things that are going on. You have a board correspondence to this effect as well. Uh, but I want Dr. Moneris to comment on some things that are occurring within the district, uh, even, as early, even as early as today. And then Linda Bardier will share a few things with you along with uh, Joe Polino. So Dr. Moneris. Thank you, Dr. Marsden. So board, yes, you have, um, and you have the board correspondence, and then we placed on the dais the same one, but we added um, a poster that I'll be referring to. And so we know that uh, behaviors don't change when it, um, through just placing a policy in place, but we do want to remind the board and let you know that we do do a, a there is a requirement that every administrator um, go over the board policy with staff at the beginning of the school year um, and to share what reports that are the forms that, that can be used if there is an incident of bullying or potential incident that staff may think about or uh, consider. And, and that is available to the parents as well. We have that on our district website and they're available at the schools. But in terms of practices, last year around um, spring of last school year, we convened a bully prevention committee and, and it's comprised of a variety of stakeholders. We've got some community-based organizations there. We've got um, assistant principals, principals, counselors, teachers, and they have been working diligently to put together and then revise uh, a handbook um, on how to not only intervene when bullying happen, happens, but we really want it to come from a preventative manner. And so that's being led by student wellness and support services specific, under the leadership of Roseanne Blumentry. And we have Stephanie Fletcher and Michelle Myers leading that work. I'm gonna highlight a few things that have been happening in that committee. I wanna start with what's the purpose of the committee. The main purpose of the committee is to establish a district-wide culture where all members are equipped and capable of identifying and addressing bully situations as they occur, ranging from disrespect to safety violations. And the committee spent time reviewing both the federal um, definition of bullying and they came up with a common definition of what bullying is for San Bernardino. And so I'll read that so that um, you are reminded, but also for those who are listening. The un bullying is the unwanted behavior that is severe or pervasive enough to create an environment that a reasonable person considers intimidating, embarrassing, hostile, abusive, or cause the person to feel emotionally, physically, and mentally unsafe or, 
or threatened. And so with that common definition, then the team went to a uh, task of, so what are the practices that are going on and what are actual actions that we're doing to, again, be preventative in this work and then intervening afterwards. And so highlights of some work that is newer for this school year, we had a poster contest that took place um, at the end of last year. And so you have a copy of that poster board it's um, the third page in your packet, uh, Dare to Care. This is um, a poster that Stephanie Ojeda, a proud senior at San Bernardino High School, she was the winner, go Cardinals, um, that the poster was voted on over two days, time span by a variety of stakeholders, and she came out on top. And so you can see that there's pieces on that poster of um, the National Education Association, Bully Free Me, logo as well as where that bullying can happen everywhere. All schools have these posters. They are, I've been at schools, I see them in different locations. We were talking actually today about working with the committee to standardize where that would be at a school site and some other pieces. So we wanna run everything through the committee so that we have lots of um, ideas and stakeholders in the room. So that's, that's a new piece that we have in place that bullying. Um, uh, bully prevention poster. Um, I want to continue just to go down some additional tasks. So I mentioned that we have a bully prevention and intervention handbook. The draft handbook is available on our district website. The committee continues to look at it, refine it, revise it. They have taken it to some middle, middle school students with the support of one of our community-based organizations, and they're giving feedback on it as well. So we are really digging into um, what the students are telling us and helping to use that to uh, refine and improve upon the handbook, right? But right now the draft is on our district website for anybody to take a look at. Um, we are going to be revising our current board policy through this in um, this committee. We hope to have that revision ready for review by, for the board um, in April. We have, um, and those are all prevention pieces. We're working collaboratively with we're starting to work with risk management because we've heard a lot of conversation around the employee side of it. So we're working on what that could look like and we'll have something ready to roll out at the beginning of next school year for our staff. Um, and then in terms of intervention, we saw Curtis Middle School come and share their work on the um, undercover bully programs. We have, many under, we have many teams that have been trained at our middle schools, and we continue to encourage staff to attend. I think we have two more trainings for this school year, but as, a, as to date, we have 13 sites trained, and then two more that will be coming out in the spring. So a lot of work in that area. I would love to highlight something that started today, and it, it was not intentional, because it took a long time to get this organized, but it's very exciting. Today we started um, Synergy Day training for um, 70 students in our district. So I want you to picture this board that um, Student Wellness and Support Services worked with our high schools first, and they said, we want you to send a team of students that represent the inclusive diversity of your campus. We're not looking for your top students. We're not looking for your students who are more challenged with behavior. We want a diverse piece of, of students coming together. And they came, um, there was five schools today. There were, the rest of the schools will be trained tomorrow. With them came teachers, came counselors from those schools, and those students are now trained to go back and lead Synergy Day at their school. So let me tell you what Synergy Day is about. Um, and I'm gonna use the language that our student wellness and support services gave me so that I do justice. Synergy Day puts a diverse group of students through a day-long experience that will change their paradigm and their lives. Students who normally may not interact on a day-to-day -day basis begin to realize how much they have in common with other students. Synergy Day shows students that although we hear and see differences on the outside, we're more alike on the inside than we know. We go through similar struggles, we have similar feelings, and we desire simil similar things. And so you could see that an activity like Synergy Day, where students are finding commonalities amongst um, their worlds, their individual worlds will bring a school together to be much more united, a welcoming, safe, and nurturing learning environment. And when you have students leading that work, you can imagine how powerful that is. So those 70 students today, tomorrow we'll have another group 
um, will go back to their schools and every high school in our district, including our continuation high schools, will have their own synergy days during the springtime. But that's just the start because we heard from our uh, superintendent student advisory that they would like to see how the high school students can start working with our middle schoolers and our middle schoolers start working with our elementary. And so we're using that model and we're gonna, that's our plan down the road. So in the summertime, we will have a synergy day for incoming freshmen at every one of our high schools. We know that that's a difficult transition for students. And again, setting the stage of a welcoming, nurturing, safe learning environment that is a preventative model to bullying behavior rather than waiting for it to rise up. The plan then is to then move this into our middle school next year and to then have our middle schools train our elementary. So we're very excited about this. The students were very excited um, and, and the staff the staff um, sees that this is something that can make a difference in terms of school climate and culture. So that's a big piece that we just started today um, and we're really proud of that work. Another um, element that I wanna point out that again happens to be right now, it wasn't planned, but this week is the Great Kindness Challenge. And so um, our school counselors, elementary, middle, and uh, our elementary and middle high schools uh, our schools, I apologize, are leading um, various kinds of kindness challenges. They vary by campus. So some examples might be something as simple as smile at 25 people today, or um, help a younger student, or greet your crossing guard. Um, a lot of the schools, I'm being told, are um, inviting friends that they may normally not spend time with to spend time with them at recess or at lunch. And many of the schools, and you may have seen something like this on YouTube, they are um, organizing where they'll go and sit with a student at lunchtime or at recess time who may be by themselves. So again, a very inclusive environment. So that's something that's happening um, this week. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Linda, and she can talk a little bit about uh, the work we actually met today and the communications that we're working on. Thank you, Dr. Menares. And our team is working collaboratively across the district to kind of find some more ways that we can make it easier for students and parents to report their concerns when it comes to bullying. Uh, we know that at Arroyo Valley High School, the team has worked together to launch their very successful Hawk line, so kudos to the admin at Arroyo Valley for that. We'd like to find ways to replicate that um, at a low cost, so we're looking at possibly partnering with some other um, companies that can provide that us uh, type of service. We're aware of two apps, Crisis Go and Catapult Emergency Management. We're also looking at the possibility of establishing an actual phone line at all of the schools. And the team from IT also made two outstanding suggestions, and one was to do a text to email and establishing a special email address for every school where someone could text in a concern. So th those are some of the things, and I know that Chief Polino also has some additional resources. Thank you, Linda. Uh, board, some things that we've done yeah, in support of the district effort to prevent and address bullying is a partnership with WeTip. And uh, WeTip is a true anonymous um, reporting platform which uh, provides a phone number that each student, staff, our community members can call 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. And that number is 1-855-86-BULLY. And to translate that into English is 1-855-862-8559. Uh, for those that's um, listening. And also um, within the department, you know, we also have a platform that can be done anonymously you know, through our compute, the computer system, which is the citizen online police reporting system, which will also uh, give the capability for our community, you know, our students, as well as our parents you know, to report bullying you know, across our system. Uh, so these are additional things that we're doing to make sure that we had a conduit for our stakeholders to be able to report bullying into our system. Thank you. And I just want to close and then, of course, um, answer any questions, board. And so you also have, and these are in draft form, so I want to let you know, but this is another piece to help our community to know um, what can 
what, what bullying is, a little summary of it, what they can do about it. We've got it both in English and Spanish. We're going to work with communications to really jazz this up. And I want to thank Ms. Rogers, because I know she's given me a lot of these different ideas in different ways. So we are listening to, to our board and the requests that are coming out to uh, support the community. And so um, any questions that the board has, we're happy to. Mr. Answer. Tillman. You know, um, I think I think with Mr. somebody mentioned a uh, a number you can call and someplace you could text. You know, the key to that is to make sure if someone sends a text or a phone call, whoever answers that phone has the wherewithal and the resources to know how to handle it and doesn't drop the ball on it. You know, my real concern is that uh, you know we have to have the right people with the right amount of authority that can make things happen real fast. The district is so large that uh, sometimes if they're just following policy, but no one within the loop um, is just thinking, at it from the, thinking about it from the perspective of here's a child that is in a bad place right now, and how do I make sure uh, we make things better for them? And if that means going to the student's house and talking to the parents and um, offering ways of um, putting the suit in a different environment or, or, or dealing with the kids that are causing the problems, it, it, it's just too serious for us to take the risk of, you know, um, for lack of a better term, dropping the ball on it. So I don't know how we do that, but um, I think on all these documents we have, I don't know about the weed tip because we don't control weed tip. As long as um, a person doesn't call that and doesn't, if we can't feel confident that they're going to um, be able to resolve the problem, I don't know how they will if they're not part of the district, then I have a concern about that. But I think even on your poster, there should be a phone number or uh, a, a text or a site, whatever the kids use, even on this happy poster, there should be something on here that tells them who they can call or contact uh, if they um, suspect they're, uh, that they're being bullied themselves or they see somebody that's um, in, a, in a bad way. But I, and even if we need to hire some more people, maybe we need to have some dedicated counselors just to deal with the bullying situation. I think is that serious. And I think we need the right people in the places to do it. Uh, it may not be something that the principals um, have the expertise to handle or the teachers. Maybe we need to hire some people that do nothing but deal with bullying to make sure that when a, a person, because when a student gets to a point where they're making a call saying, I'm being bullied, it's bad. And the worst thing we could do is, uh, is not to have the resources to fix the problem. So I, if, if, it, if, it, if we need to talk about budgeting more money or spending more money to do it, I think we should do it. I think it's, it's that important. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Mr. Tillman. Ms. Shelby? Do you mind explaining for me how you gathered student input for this initiative? Just, I have my own suspicions about uh, what they said, but I was wondering how you went about talking to students about it. Um, Isabel, are you speaking specifically about the, the committee itself or? Yeah, I believe you mentioned that you had taken input from the advisory council. So um, that was specifically to the Bully Prevention and Intervention Handbook. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have students, um, that's a really good question, same question I asked to make sure I could answer it. We have students that are working with some outside providers in our community that are um, uh, trained in um, domestic violence and other abusive relationships and and so these students are working with them and we we have we went through that route because those students we knew that they would have somebody there with them to help support so that's our first stab at getting some middle school um, responses on this particular document okay dr. Flores uh, yes I just uh, wanted to comment that I think that we have to change the culture as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have a culture right now of bullying. And uh, right now we're doing stopgap things, which is okay. Um, but we have to really, really begin to focus on, you know, asking the kids, uh, parents, uh, our staff, you know, how can we uh, shift, you know, the culture? 
um, and because um, it is social. And um, then also, my concern also is what happens when, you know, our kids slip through the cracks. I mean, Danny, what you brought up about having people ready to handle it, um, you know, as a parent, you may not know what to do. You know, what is it that you do, uh, you know, with a child that, um, you know, is so desperate um, that uh, they want to end their life? Uh, that's unacceptable. And so we really have to be mindful, not just mindful, but very deliberate. And, um, you know, I don't know if you call it crisis management uh, or, you know, um, because there will be times when uh, adults drop the ball. And so um, we, we have to be ready to uh, meet the needs of uh, our parents and our kids. So that's just what I wanted to comment on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Um, any other board members? If not, I do want to make a comment regarding making sure that this information is also posted on the website, all social media outlets, where it's, it's saved in the first thing that they get to see somewhere on the first page, on the website as well, something where they can have maybe keeping the, um, I'm not sure how it's called, where they, um, you keep it on the social media piece where it's on top and they get to see that. So the students are able to, or parents are able to get information. So we wanna be mindful of that. And also incorporate cyberbullying. And unfortunately it's not just students, there's adult bullies and parents that could possibly be bullies. And so we need to make sure that we are including that part with the social media aspect. Yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Gallo. Yes, thank you. And, and I, I know, and I think I heard it from Rachel and, and Linda too, that this is a, a, a multi-pronged approach. It's not just like we're gonna have a hotline and, and defer you know, this activity to a hotline. As Danny was mentioning, you wanna make sure there's responsiveness on it too. And, and I know that's been built into our you know, safety, our strategic uh, element number nine on school culture and climate. And it, it's all integrated as part of a, a whole strategy on how you create a safe environment, not only in, in reporting, crises or, or these types of, um, you know, bullying type events, but, uh, uh, you know, having that whole school climate uh, uh, created. So I think when we say the principals aren't necessarily, you know, uh, experts at it and everything, they've certainly got to be experts at creating an awareness and creating a school culture and creating that environment uh, where students feel safe and talking to the multiplicity of, uh, in, and the escalated roles that you identify in this little, um, you know, bookmark thing. Um, you start with your teacher, uh, counselor, uh, report to a director, then ultimately the superintendent, and you know things. So, I, I think to create a, a multifaceted reporting level is what I think I heard you say, and I think uh, that that's great. And uh, this is a really good start. I love the idea of ensuring that we get student voice and participation because, quite frankly, the students. Uh, uh, can be the biggest, um, I think, uh, on the ground uh, intervention team uh, beyond even the adults. Um, you know, when it reaches an adult level, that means your entire, you know, student body's collapsed in a way to help protect their own. So um, I, I like the direction you're going in and appreciate you guys uh, taking this on and recognizing the diversity of, of uh, the solutions here. So thanks, thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Right. Linda. Thank you for the presentation. Also incorporate um, economic for those students that are economically challenged as well as um, disabilities and the LGBTQ, which I imagine you will. All right, thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and move on to 3.3. .3. Item 3.3, .3, alternative board meetings, locations update. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Medina. And uh, with that, uh, coming back to this topic, as you know, the county boardroom that we thought would be available is no longer available uh, due to their renovation. So uh, Ms. Christakos has uh, some ideas or considerations. So we do have a recommendation for the Norton Regional Events Center main auditorium. Um, it does have limited seating of 106 um, seats. And so um, we could always, uh, if we have a lot of awards and such, we could have it at Indian Springs Multipurpose Room and the Performing Arts Center when we're done. So I leave that up to the board, but the Regional Event Center is available. Mr. Tillman. 
Yeah, well, if we're going to have any outstanding student awards and if we get a, a sense that we're going to have a larger crowds, then we definitely should go to a, a location that seats more than 106 people. So I don't know what is, uh, what's the capacity? This is how many? Oh, this. Um, what's on the wall right there? Past. I thought it was 200 and 200. 200. Yeah. And so this gets crowded sometimes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I guess when we do the outstanding students, we should go to a different place, maybe. And, and maybe we can look at it um, depending on where the schools are. Because, like, if they're schools from the west side, maybe we can do it at Royal Valley's auditorium. Mm -hmm. If they're on the east side, maybe do San Z or Indian Springs. But maybe we can do it based on location in terms of when we do the outstanding student awards. So we could look, um, work with Linda's team and look at the schedule for the future board meetings through September and when we do have a large uh, group and kind of assign different sites. We'll just have to make sure that we post all that so folks know where we will be. Right. All right, Dr. Wyatt. Thank you, Madam President. Kind of along with uh, what uh, Mr. Tillman's saying is, um, you know, if we could have it at Indian Springs. I mean, I wanted to look at the Norton Regional Events Center and um, you know, a little bit of a description there. Does it have all the audio visual that we need, live streaming, all that there? I've never, I don't know if I've been to that facility, so I'm kind of it's trying really to, nice. is it really nice? nice? Yeah, it's really nice. Okay, okay. very good. My other concern is uh, in Indian Springs High School, it's our school in our district, and you know, if we wanted to keep it in-house, to me, I think that's nice as well. So just my two cents, thanks. Dr. Flores? Um, I like what Mr. Tillman said about, if I think once a month we give awards and it would be great to have it at the high school that, that feeds in, all the schools that feed into that high school and parents would, you know, get, become familiar with the high school and so forth. And then the other off days, I mean, off um, meetings, we could be at the, the Norton place. That's what I would, um, yeah. I, I don't think it would be that difficult, but I think it would be great to have our families um, in the location where they all are feeder schools. So next next board meeting, if that's the direction, I don't know if anyone else has comments, maybe we could put together a schedule for the next six six to eight months. Sounds great. Based on so our board. next meeting will be not here? Our next meeting's here, it's our last one. Is our are last we? one? Yeah. In that's February, February okay. the seventh would be. In. Okay. Is that the meeting where we give the awards? No. 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 The second meeting. The second meeting, okay. All right. All right, thank you. Any other board comments? If not, let's go ahead and move forward to session six, reports and comments. 6.1, uh, unfortunate for this SBTA, San Bernardino Teachers Association, Ashley uh, Alcala is not able to be here. So we're gonna go ahead and move to 6.2, report by California School Employees Association. Is John Simpson here? No, no report. Okay, no report. 6.3, report by Communication Workers of America, Stefan Gianni. I, I don't see him here. He's, He's here, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. The report Go tonight? Ahead. Yeah. Come on up. No, yes. Okay, okay. thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Stephen. All right, 6.4, report by San Bernardino School Police Officers Association, Daniel Arias. No comments. How about report by San Bernardino school managers? No report. Uh, comments by board members. Okay, Dr. Flores. Yes, I have just a few. Um, I would like to propose that we name a school after Francis Grice yes. and that we move to, um, you know, um, look to see where in the area, probably the west side, where we could name a school. I think that would be a great honor to her civil rights activism and honoring her legacy. Yes. So I would like to propose that. Okay. Can, okay. can I just say, um, I, I, I think it's a great idea to um, look at naming a school. I don't think we have to limit it to the west side only because oh, okay. um, her whole thrust was- Was that, the whole- Right. Okay, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I think that would be great. You also have to remember San Gregorio. Right. There was an area where African American students weren't allowed to travel mm -hmm. towards right. certain areas, and so right. she was a big advocate in making sure right. you don't realize the history of San Bernardino right. was not always. Um, yeah, and especially she led the way for um, 
African American teachers to be hired, you know. Um, and uh, I wanted to share with the board today that I went to uh, the FLI today. There's uh, over 60 uh, parents there at the New Hope uh, Church Recreational Center where Dr. I mean, where Colonel Kickbush, Lieutenant Colonel Kickbush was there. And I know Dr. Marsden, you stopped by, and so did Dr. Monatis. And they were really, really uh, so uh, pleased that we all went uh, to give our um, welcoming to them and so forth. I was really impressed. Uh, they were participating. I only stayed for an hour, uh, but we had some African-American parents, uh, mostly Latino parents, but there was translators, and it was full. And that church has Vietnamese, I think there were some Vietnamese also parents, and Latino parents um, that uh, go to that, that particular church. So it was wonderful. I, I, I really, really appreciated it. And I also went to the grading committee um, at PDC. Uh, I was, that's why I was a little bit, just barely made it in. And it was phenomenal. There were 57 teachers uh, that were represented. And Dr. Joe uh, Johnson, um, the director of INCUS from San Diego State, and the current dean of the College of Ed was there and gave update on research uh, for grading practices, what, what was not acceptable and what were acceptable. Um, and then also Dr. Sarah Feldman from Ed Trust West was there, and uh, she also um, gave uh, examples of the report uh, that they did um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I really think we should all see that report and get copies of it, Dr. Marsden, mm -hmm. so that we can see their findings, because um, they did share some of the findings. And I think that's a, a good baseline for us to show uh, as we grow and meeting the, the needs of our kids in terms of not just attendance, but academics and, and A through G. So that could be our baseline to, to track our, our growth. So I, I, I wanted to stay longer, but because I wanted to hear the teacher's comments, but I had to come here. I also like to thank, <laughs> I also would like to thank um, Dr. Monitis for all your work that you're doing on bullying. I know that Dr. Mitchell did a tremendous job as well, starting off with uh, just having our handbook and so that's a very good base for us to start with, but uh, I think you're gonna have added value to all of it, and I really do think uh, we're headed in the right direction in terms of asking students and our staff and our parents and so forth. Um, the challenge is always here we have what we wanna do, but how do we implement it with fidelity and with integrity? Uh, that's, that's always the challenge, so I think that's, Really, really good. And I also like to thank Chief Paulino. Chief, I really uh, appreciate the data on uh, the citations and, and just the specifics of it. Uh, I don't know if all of you got to look at them in our, our um, uh, board correspondence, but uh, it just reflects, you know, the, um, you know, I mean, I mean, it's going down, which is really important, uh, and so that our students know that we support them. Uh, and public should also know that those citations are like tickets, but I mean, kids are still uh, being suspended and, and expelled, but not because uh, the citations are very, really egregious things that they do. So anything. Anyway, that's it. And thank you so much. Doc, thank you, Dr. Flores. Um, I have Dr. White. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, just along the lines of our conversation on bullying, um, I, I was very fortunate to attend um, the Bullying Prevention Committee this uh, last week. And I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Morales and uh, Rose Bowman Tree and their team for uh, hosting that meeting and having a very robust conversation, a lot of uh, participation by our employees as well as community members. And, and just for me, a, a learning experience that the district is doing quite a bit already in regards to bullying, and that communication is key. And I think sometimes, you know, out there, our, our community does not know what the district is doing because maybe the message isn't getting out there. So just as a parent, as well as a board member, I want to make sure to um, 
you know, give the confidence to our community and our parents out there that this district is actively you know, looking at bullying prevention on many, many different levels in regards to our handbook and different programs we have. And correct me if this is wrong, or is it our undercover bullies, agents that go out there that are students and- um, Our staff. Uh, is it our staff as well, undercovers? No, it's our students. Our students, right? Oh, yeah. Which, are, you know, I haven't seen it, but I'd love yeah. to maybe see some of the students maybe come and talk about their experience here to the board and, and share how that feels to be an undercover boy and agent just so we could get a, a student's perspective as well. Because I know I had to, to experience it as a parent with one of my children mm -hmm. and, and it is not a pleasant experience because it really does adversely impact the student mm -hmm. and parents as well because you know nobody wants to know that their child's being bullied. Right. But I will say as a parent, and this was a few years back, the response I had from district admin um, was phenomenal. Uh, matter of fact, even central office admin came and met with us and um, and reacted at a site level. So, you know, we are doing, this was many years ago, so I just want to reinforce that out there to our community that this is not a new topic to us. This is a topic that will always be there, but how do we continuously try to meet that challenge of working with boys? Um, on that note, I know that we, we had a, a, you know, a person come in today, and I apologize, I don't remember the name, but we also had, um, concerns brought to us by our staff. And, and we do have a board correspondence here, thank you Dr. Wiseman for providing that, um, that says you know we're looking at Target Solutions, which is an online training program, I'm very familiar with it myself, um, that has a uh, number of trainings already out there, but it looks like a, we as a district are gonna kinda wanna hone in and create our own, maybe more specific to our district and the concerns of our, our staff as well. Um, and it looks like a possible implementation of 2018-19 I'm wondering, you know, and I know we have to work with our collective bargaining units and talk with them, but what about admin? Is that something that maybe we can pilot with admin a little bit sooner? Because uh, maybe we have a little more control and say so about that, and just to get that going, because it seems to be where a concern is right now. So I just want to put that out there as well. So yes is the answer. Very good, thank you. And then uh, last, just want to um, thank our folks from uh, Youth Services. They hosted our county CWA meeting uh, last week, and. Um, had a very, very engaging conversation with our CWA directors from the Valley region, which is down here, on chronic absenteeism and you know how that is a, a huge issue across many districts, even our model districts, I wanna say that. Um, you know, San Mario City has a model SARB, um, but when you really get to take a look at what's out there on DataQuest now, you really can disaggregate the data and target specific subgroups, grades, schools for intervention. And I think that's really neat. and. You know, with our district specifically, and I was talking with Mr. Culberson, and again, I want to thank him, just kind of our short notes put that meeting together for us. Um, we noticed that there's a high level of chronic absenteeism in our continuation schools, which was extremely high, mm. uh, as well as our special ed population. Mm. And, and I understand both those populations very well, and they have very unique challenges there, but just how can we better support our, our employees, our admin, our district, in meeting those challenging populations to reduce the chronic absenteeism, because in our continuation schools, it was in the high 70 percentile, 78, 79 percent, and I don't quite remember the special ed um, number, but it was pretty high as well. Yeah. So just areas that we, I wanna discuss, put the conversation out there, and support our staff and our admin on, on attacking chronic absenteeism, because mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. if our kids are out of school, obviously they're not learning, so there's a lot of negatives to that, and plus also it is a, a revenue issue as well, so. Again, thank you to the team and for having that great discussion and youth services, so. Thank Sorry. you so much, um, Dr. Wyatt. Uh, Barbara, Dr. Flores, you had us. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that, like what we're doing with the students, we should be doing it with our, uh, our unions, you know, with um, CSCA, with uh, our teachers, um, with our administrators in terms of bullying. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad, um, Dr. Wiseman, that you're going to implement that and, and so forth. However, it has to be very concrete given what uh, we heard last, last meeting um, that we do um, follow through and uh, make sure that we don't promote that culture because kids will see us and if we're not uh, adhering to an anti-bullying culture among ourselves, I mean, that, that's reflective of the culture as well. Okay, so thank I'd you. like thank to just you, say Dr. That. Flores. Um, this, we're going to go ahead and move to six. Oh wait, I'm sorry, Mr. Gallo. I was already. Yeah, we're, uh, yeah. I, I had uh, one comment I wanted to raise uh, during 
uh, kind of, um, I could bring it up later, but I just wanted to uh, have it on our follow-up list. Um, I talked once, uh, well, several times about um, creating um, a learning environment, perhaps a, lo a smaller learning environment for uh, students who um, have chronic behavioral issues in other schools. And, um, you know, we talked about um, a leadership type academy, um, a, a different way of creating a, a positive role model environment with responsibilities that students have for, say, even underclassmen, um, you know, the, the, their prior class and students and things. Kind of that military model, the duty, honor, respect mindset that, um, again, is part of an integrated solution on how you address the issues of you know, from bullying to uh, just just chronic behavioral issues at some of our comprehensive environments and things, and uh, to ensure we're creating that positive climate, not only at that school environment, but that you're doing something more positive than suspending or or sending them away from school, which is probably one of the more positive Good environments like they could remain in. So I'm um, thinking of uh, uh, a way that we might be able to create um, in, in our mindset for these smaller learning communities. And we talked about, you know, maybe even a district-sponsored charter or a different kind of environment, uh, perhaps, that uh, we've never really tried uh, here, here as well. You know, I, I know we get a lot of charter school uh, petitions and things, but this is a... This, to me, is a need that uh, really isn't being addressed by us. I mean, we're trying to address it in the comprehensive environment through these kinds of, you know, drug courts, uh, the, the student kind of courts, and other kinds of things uh, uh, like that. But this, um, this may be putting, you know, students in this... Um, leadership type environment, I think is something we should really look at. We said, we kind of said collectively, yeah, it's a good thing to go look at. And um, I just want to see that make it to our follow-up list, okay, in some way. So, so if we, we could that. capture that and put it on. Yeah, and I, maybe there's I know we, we talked about this. this as a cabinet, and I'm not seeing it. Uh, yeah, I didn't either. When I read the we'll, when I read the things, yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure I got it out on sure, the... Sure, we'll codify that. Uh, great, comment. perfect. Thank yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and move into 6.7, comments by superintendent and staff members, and we also have five minutes for that. Thank you, Ms. Medina. And just in this kind of sense of, uh, you know, uh, topics around bullying, you know, we heard from Dr. Flores on grading practices uh, and, and several other areas board. Just I want to compliment our team. We've brought in some outside experts that have just given us some fantastic feedback in that third point of view helps us, you, know, you think about partners like West Ed, Ed Trust West, NCUST, CABE, school services, time and time again, these folks give us an outside snapshot with their expertise to help us really dig in on some of these uh, areas that are, that are you know, cause some real needs. So grateful for that. To, to that extent, we had a, a third party review uh, this week with the California Teaching Credential. I gotta pass along a compliment. They interviewed me today and uh, Dr. Wiseman, this compliment is to your team with a professional development for our teachers and staff. Uh, they said that if, and these were high leaders in, in CTC, California Teaching Credential Group out of Sacramento, they said that if they had to recommend to somebody a model program for teacher induction and development, they would send them here. That was a huge compliment. Uh, so the, the team has, has hit the sweet spot in terms of doing the right things as they interviewed teacher after teacher after teacher, new teachers, they're saying they're feeling supported, undergirded by really quality, real quality work, and it's, uh, it's paying off. So congratulations to your team. Uh, please extend that congratulations to them. Also want to recognize staff board. You know Carmel Brand, our athletic director at Pacific High School. She's been selected to receive the California State Athletic Director's Sue Kamiyama Leadership Award for the 2017-18 school year. This award is presented to an outstanding athletic director who's shown exceptional leadership skills over a long and meritorious career. So congratulations to her. Uh, school recognition, Molina Healthcare will be donating umbrellas and ponchos to the students of Musquay Elementary School on Tuesday, January 30th. Uh, board, if you're interested in attending this event, please contact Karen for additional details. Congratulations to these students and staff, and thank you to our partners at Molina Healthcare for their gracious support. 
Also received a thank you letter from Assemblymember Elise Gomez Reyes for our support of the young legislators and their trip to Sacramento next month. During this trip, approximately 15 district students will tour the state capitol, meet and greet state officials, staff, and attending assembly committee hearing, four sessions, and share potential legislative ideas impacting youth in San Bernardino. And then uh, earlier today, I stopped by our pregnant minors training program. Many of the young ladies, uh, many of the fathers were present at the training, and I gotta tell you, it's fantastic. Uh, they do a great job of helping inspire these kids and make them aware of the, the support services that are available for them uh, in the community, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, board, I want to uh, just remind you there will be a uh, community invite for a, a superintendent movie night showing a film titled Paper Tigers. Uh, I really want to encourage you to attend. This, this will demonstrate to our community the challenges our students face, why the things that we're doing around social emotional learning are so key, and it will leave them with some things they can specifically do and go back out to help support the district. That'll be March 2nd, 4 p.m will be the VIP greeting and then we'll have a panel discussion. Very excited about that. And then board, I wanted to ask for your consensus. Uh, we would like to have Tuesday, February 6th, which is our last meeting in this room uh, for a bit, uh, regarding negotiations and potential budget impact. Uh, we'd like to have the meeting uh, workshop with you from 4.30 to 5.30. Uh, do I have your consensus to have that uh, schedule? Dr. Wyatt, yes, sir. great, Ms. Medina, Ms. Yes. Rogers, Mr. Tillman, fantastic. So thank you, those are all my comments. Ms. Medina, yes. can I make an announcement? I, didn't, I know I didn't speak at the yes, appropriate time, but um, working with the district, we are taking buses to the Black College Expo, and, and I just wanted to make sure we encourage the parents. I know this meeting will be televised on Saturday, so the parents that are viewing on TV, it's a great opportunity. You don't have to be African American to go to the Black College Expo. All students can go. And you have colleges representing not just uh, historically Black College University, but um, USC, UCLA, LMU, all of them. Um, my daughter right now is in Japan, um, but she got a full ride to LMU. And LMU happens to have an exchange program with um, Kansai, I think that's the name of it a school in Japan, so she left last week and she'll be there till May. But she got the, a free application and turned in the application at the Black College Expo. And, and based on that, they offered her a uh, full academic scholarship. But if she had not gone to the Black College Expo, she wouldn't have got it. And then another student we took last year got a full <coughs> ride, uh, just one of them, got a full ride at University of Redlands. Same thing. Wow. She filled out the application at the Black College Expo and got when is the offer. That? It's is on it? February the 10th. So Where we'll, at? right, and it's in, it's in Los Angeles. So we'll, leave, we'll have buses leaving from here, going there. The buses leave here about 9 30 in the morning. We'll come back around 2 or 3. From this spot? Yes, from 777 F Street. Okay. Thank you, and, and board, forgive me, I had one more comment, didn't read my notes. Dr. Volkermer wanted to um, give you an update on our community engagement plan. We'll be asking later for your uh, direct involvement around key strategies, so give some thought to that, but in the meantime, Dr. Volkermer. Thank you, Dr. Marsden. I mentioned this at our last board meeting, and I just wanted to remind you, board, that uh, next Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, we'll be having what we're calling a re-energizing forum where we'll be meeting with our principals and our directors and union representatives from their shops to talk about how we get the community engagement plan deeply into the field. And so if you'd like to attend, we'd love to have you. That's 8 to noon on January 31st uh, at the PDC. And actually, breakfast starts at 7.30. So if you like breakfast, 7.30, we'll start promptly at 8. Love to have you there. Thank All you. Right. OK, moving along. This is community engagement plan. Community. Yeah. Okay. We're moving along to session, I mean to item, uh, consent item, consent calendar 7.0. And so any items are being pulled? Need a motion first. So moved. 
Okay. Okay, any discussion which items they would like to be pulled? We, uh, so no, there are no items to be pulled. You have a motion, a second, but there is discussion. Uh, so we have a member of the public that would like to comment on item 7.20. So at this time, I would ask staff to uh, turn to item 7.20. Why don't we uh, pull that item and then vote on the other ones and let yeah. them talk on it and then vote on it? Want to do that? We can. Yeah, like we do. Board's prerogative. Yeah, that'd be the best way to do it. Okay. So we'll go ahead so and we'll pull, pull item 7.20. Okay. Mr. Tillman's request. Okay. Any other pulled items by the board? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go ahead and, and vote. So, Mr. Uh, Tillman, you still have your motion then for approval and, and second. Second by Mr. Gallo. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. All right, the motion passes. 7.20. Thank you, Ms. Medina. Uh, and while our member of the public's making their way forward, I'll have staff comment on this item for the board. Yes. Item 7.20, agreement with West Ed, San Francisco to build capacity, improve developmental academic outcomes for Who's the support. member of the, of the public? Uh, it'd be uh, Ms. Linda Hart. So she's, she's making her way forward. Oh. And uh, Dr. Moneras will comment on that item. So board, this is a contract that we would like to enter enter into with West Ed. West Ed produced a, uh, a rubric for program evaluation of special ed programs in um, September of this school year, so it's relatively new. We actually only know of one other district in the state right now, San, Fran San Diego, am I correct, Mr. Dominguez, that is using this, that use this to evaluate their, their current programs. We intend on bringing together a task force of teachers, speech, psychologists, general education teachers, principals, to work with West Ed to see how uh, what we can do to improve our programs, have a report to then present to the board in, in June, and then we want to continue the work with them. We've been very clear with them. We want them to help us learn to fish. We don't want to be reliant on them, and they are in agreement with that. So we anticipate being done with them within a two-year time span. Thank you, Dr. Moneras. <coughs> board, did you have any questions for Dr. Moneras before we invite our member of the public to talk, comment? Okay, with no further ado, Ms. Hart. Uh, hello. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, chair, board members, and superintendent. Basically, I'm here just to congratulate you, first of all, for choosing um, Ed West to be part of this process. I had an opportunity to go through your dashboard and take a look at um, the children with special needs and the children with disabilities. I was really concerned um, from citations to academic achievement, they were the lowest. And so for, for me, that was uh, a lot of red flags going up. So it was good to see that you are taking that action. Uh, just one of the concerns that I did have in, in just reading uh, what you do have here, it mentioned key root causes. And so I was not really sure what that meant. Uh, does that mean looking at the family dynamics, uh, what's happening environmental, what's happening within um, their household? What, does it even include engaging with the parents? Because just working with the children, well, that's one factor. But then a major factor is our kids going to be, in, I mean, our families and parents going to be part of the process to identify the key factors. So that's basically what I just wanted to share. I would also like to know, I went back on the dashboard, and earlier last week, it was easy. I just went onto your website, clicked on dashboard. But today, I had difficulties. It disappeared. I don't know where it is now on your website. Yeah, we had some challenges with our, our website today. It was down oh, okay. for a while. It's back up now. So all right. I thought it was my computer. No, no, no worries. I was like, okay. That's right. Okay, that's good to know uh, because I like the way that you have it. User-friendly, you just click on it, and then boom, everything is there. I did try to go on to the California. I guess they're having problems too because I couldn't access yeah, that's anything. Right. That's also, correct. this crossed the board. Yep. Oh, that's okay. Yep. That's good to know. Yep. But I um, just, again, just want to congratulate you on your efforts and moving in that direction and looking forward to your continuing um, doing so. But I also want to um, acknowledge Gwen. There was an incident that took place with my granddaughter. She came out of uh, a charter school, and so she wanted to go to a public school. And within the two months that she was in a public school, 
she mentioned to me that there was an award uh, for African American students, and I, um, I, I said, so are you going? And she said, no, because it's irrelevant. I said, first of all, spell it. But um, I, after further uh, investigation, she mentioned to me that one of the teachers told her the only reason she was getting it was because she was black. Now, for those of you who know me, that was the wrong thing to share with me because I'm thinking in my head, when we were talking about bullying, are the teachers also bullying the kids? Are they minimizing you know, their existence? Coming out of you know, this particular um, charter school, she exhibited high expectations for herself. And this, within two months, she's going to tell me that it was irrelevant for her to attend an award where she was going to receive an award. But just based on the color of her skin, that was unacceptable for me. Oh, yeah. So I contact Ms. Rogers, and we had a conversation. And we ended up uh, having a conversation with the particular principal at the school. So I hope that this was just a isolate incident, or is it cross the board? I don't know how or what tools you have to make sure that this type of incident doesn't happen again. So again, congratulations, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ms. Hart. Thank you. Ms. Hart. Dr. Flores. Yes, thank you, Madam <laughs> President. I just wanted to thank you for bringing up to us again that we should include the parents mm -hmm. because um, with special needs kids, parents need to be included also in any strategies that we uh, propose because it is difficult for them as well. And, and if they're learning strategies in school, the parents should also be Correct. part of it. And so thank you. And I, I feel really bad that that happened to your granddaughter. Mm -hmm. It is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but it was taken care of? Yes, it was. Okay, okay great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. and, and I do want to make a quick clarification. Charter schools are public schools. What they call them is traditionals versus charter. So that's just like a little. Oh, it's traditional yeah. now? So it's, well, it's, uh, charter schools are public schools. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they, they have a, just a traditional versus uh, charter schools. Okay. So they'll, they'll call our system Duly noted. traditional. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Just an insight. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Hart. We're going to go ahead and move. Item 7.20. 7.20. We have to approve this. Yeah, yes. you need. So, do we have a motion? I move to approve it. Second. Any, any further discussion? If not, okay, let's go ahead and vote. All right. Okay. Let's go. Motion passes. We're going to go to 8.0 action items. 8.1 personnel report number 12, dated January 23, uh, 2018. As presented. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, is there any, dis any further discussion? If not, we're going to go ahead and vote. Motion carries 6 0. Okay. Uh, 8.2, resolution approving the renewal of the charter school petition of the Woodward Leadership Academy by the governing board of San Bernardino City Unified School District. So moved. Second. Is there any further discussion? Any yes. discussion? Dr. Flores? Yes, Madam President. Um, I wanted to ask Dr. Um, Mitchell. Um, they're, they're required to submit something by uh, February 28th. Did we put anything in there uh, for Woodard? 8.2. 8.2. Oh, okay. In our board correspondence, you noted that they would be submitting additional uh, requirements uh, on February 25th. Yes, and so there's some new education codes that we would like them to use uh, to incorporate into their charter uh -huh. around um, being on the board and being, and, you know, and right. the, the conflict of interest between being a teacher and being on the board, or, or being on the board and make, having contracts that benefit yourself. So, so we want to um, protect our liabilities, and so we've asked as all of our charters renew that they incorporate this into their charters. Okay, and if they don't do it, 
we'll, we'll, we'll work with them until they do. Until they do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. So it will, so they, that's all it, that they need. Okay. I just wondered what the requirement was. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Cool. We voted, uh, call for a vote. Okay. Motion carries. Motion carries. Let's go ahead Go ahead to item 8.3, ongoing board initiatives. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Let's go ahead and vote. Okay. Motion carries. Um, we have 8.4, board top 10. So moved. A second. second. Okay. Any further discussion? Yeah, I have a, just a quick question yes. on that. So um, I just want, and this is something I've already brought to your attention, Dr. Marsden. I'm just, where do I find or where would it be reflected that we're going to be looking at the dashboard, you know, the local or the localized dashboard for us, and then also that we will be getting update or information or it's ongoing that we are monitoring the DNF reports. Sure. So one of the things you and I talked about, and we, we could certainly add it to the top ten if it's the board's pleasure, or we can add it. If it's not on, I'm, look, I'm looking right. Yeah, now I was to trying to find. I looked ahead, as well. but I wasn't board. sure. It's on future follow, future, future board, board meetings. meetings. It's so under future, future board meetings. We have it as a topic. For the dashboards. Of, yeah. So if, if I can draw your attention to. Uh, Eight point is that over? Was that on this report? It was when we looked at it in uh, cabinet. We looked at it in cabinet. Matter of fact, uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Gallo. Page uh, 27. Where? Well, what was 20, that? Future okay. agenda okay. items. Oh no no no. Wait. Eight point six. 8.6, uh, if we'll go down and let's Second one, grade, grade 8, 9, failure rate. So that's oh, yeah. what it falls under? It, so what we're going to do, uh, Ms. Rogers, is because it's really a grading practices, mm -hmm. we wanted to keep the titles of our KPI presentations this consistent. Um, we're right now, staff is preparing to update and revise our KPIs consistent with the state's new mm -hmm. language and lingo. Um, and so what we're going to do with this is give you the standard DNF report, but then also give you an update on our, on our grading practices committee, as well as update you on the dashboard and the, the update is of our So KPI. in the eight point, and the reason why I'm asking that, because again, that's more so of something I definitely want to make sure we're doing it quarterly yes. versus at the end of the year, or I don't know, it may fall in August, but it's not helpful for it to fall in August and let's get that information after the fact when there's there's no interventions to help the students. Yeah, so the great, the great, the great eight, nine math failure report, this would be the second one. This represents sec first semester, second quarter. So you've gotten one before, so you are, well, you will receive these updates quarterly. Okay. And, um, and annually, as the states revise their state accountability system, mm -hmm. you'll receive uh, updates on, you know, how we did on CASP and, and all those kinds of things. But th this report you'll receive quarterly. Okay. And as and, we discussed, and, oh, mm -hmm, as we discussed during our, our meeting to review the agenda, we are looking at having a quarterly report card mm -hmm, that can right. be communicated with the board, the public, right. our, our own district, within mm -hmm. the district, around academics and behavior. So right. that would be something that would be summarized. And that's the dashboard. And that would be, that would be considered okay. the dashboard. Because yeah. that is helpful, again, so that as we're talking to parents and, you know, academics, academics, these other things that's taking place is great. But when it comes down to it, we still have to make sure we're making progress in academics while we do all those other things because a lot of those things are going to take forever but some things just like a parent would or just like anyone else that's evaluated if we see we're going in the wrong direction my goal is to say let's go in the opposite direction and then you we're narrowing it down to teachers and individuals that are giving out these grades to see where we can make this a system this right the support can be there for them. So I bring that up so that all the other board members will understand where that's coming from. That's really coming from saying we need to see that while we do all these other things, we need to know how we're we progressing with our students academically. And then maybe those that are giving out the grades, where can the supports be put? So thank yeah. you. And this is something that we recognize is very important to the board. Uh, so, you know, again, not only as Dr. Mitchell mentioned, is it under future agenda items, if you go back under item 8.3 on page 25, you'll see the grading practices committee dashboard. And so that's, again, part so of this work as this so matures, mm -hmm. we're going to have uh, the academics okay. and the behavioral in that dashboard. piece in the dashboard. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're working toward. Perfect. That's, yeah. that's what I'm looking Just want to make sure where, what category it's in. So you great. Bet. Thank you. Yep. That's it. 
Did we have a motion? So you have a motion and a second on the board's top 10, 8.4. Right, if not, we're going to go ahead and vote. Okay, motion carries. 8.5, board. No, we did that one. No, you, on the we board follow up, okay, you did board, not. Board, board so, follow up. So move. Second. Any discussion? Let's go ahead and vote. This might be the one I'd. Yeah, we would yeah. add your comment, Mr. Gallo, Thank relative you. to the uh, learning environment that you Thank discussed. You. Okay, and then eight point motion carries. Eight point six future agenda item. So moved. Second. Any any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, we're going to be going into close 9.0 closed session, and just so you know, we are 30 minutes ahead of time, and let's continue that moment. Move, uh, movement, so. Uh, we will report ahead. out. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> okay, we are back. We have a quorum, so we're going to go ahead and move forward. We're back from closed session, 10.0, action item. So move. Wait, wait, hold on. Let me, um, wait, I have to read it. So it's. Camera's on. So requester, special education director, approver, assistant superintendent, of student services, SS-17-18-04, be it resolved that the Board of Education approves the settlement authority number SS-17-18-04 in the amount of $49,700. Be it for the resolve that the Board of Education authorizes Deborah Love, purchasing director, to sign any related documents. So moved. Second. Okay, is there any further dis any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and vote. And before we close the, the meeting, just letting you know that 10.1 uh, has, they pulled their petition, so we're going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. Good night. <laughs>